Good afternoon. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. Whew. I'm trying to catch my breath because uh, I'm working again these days. And I'm working in Cincinnati. And I just came in off the road. And I'm pretty pleased with myself that I've driven down, down there today, had my meeting, and I'm back with you. And no tickets, praise the Lord. Uh, <laughs> no, but thank you. Uh, we're going to get started uh, today. As I always start out with welcome. Um, this is, I think it'll be our last meeting of the calendar year 2018. And so thank you all for hanging in with us and, and being here. And this is really weird that I have this microphone up here making all of this noise today. I don't usually hear myself, but I feel that I do now. Are we good back there? Okay. So the first uh, item of business uh, would be the November, the approval of the November 14th commission uh, minutes. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. There's so moved. Second. 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 Are there any questions or concerns about the minutes? Then all in favor of approval, please raise your hand. Approved. Thank you. Um, we're going to move into subcommittee reports uh, today. And we're going to start with Hari. Andrea? All right. Well, we've met four times since the last meeting. Jeez. And we are, <laughs> yes, we are on it. <laughs> uh, so we took a deeper dive into the hiring process with Civil Service Commission staff um, and looking at charter guidelines and, the, and, and that process. We even had the opportunity of, of looking at a COPE scenario, which was very informative for us. We talked to representatives from Columbus State uh, Community College from their criminal justice program, got a good idea of their trend analysis in terms of, of their students and the interests that they have or not in terms of becoming police officers and actually coming, going into the criminal justice field. They're actually seeing a 50% reduction of interest in students in the field. So mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it's kind of a national trend that, that we've been seeing too. Um, we also talked with a former sergeant of the um, Recruiting from CBT got the got the historical aspect of what was done in the past, how that might be applied to um, present day. Any any you know any thoughts from from that individual? We talked um, at, at length with him, and then we recently talked with the public safety manager, resource analyst, and a, and a polygraph individual in the selection process, and really looked deeply at the polygraph experience, how that works. Almost felt like we had a polygraph experience ourselves. You know that's how deep it was backgrounds and oral review boards. And it, it seems that the common theme about the length of the hiring practice or why it takes so long might be rooted in, in civil service guidelines and charter guidelines. So that's kind of like a upper view of it. And that's it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Four times since the last meeting. And we already have our next January meeting schedule. OK, you're going to take a little break now. Yes, ma'am. OK, great. Thank you. You're welcome. The training subcommittee, and Matthew, I think you're going to uh, present that report today. I'll brief out on behalf of Brooke, who's not here today. I'm embarrassed to say we only met once, but we will shoot for four. Uh, basically, what we did was we took all of the ideas and comments and topics from the roundtable from August and went through those and looked at either what's already been discussed or what's already been uh, presented to us. Went through, narrowed some of those down. We made a request and reviewed some of the training material that Commander Meter provided. So most of the material uh, from OPADA was reviewed, especially as it relates to the commission. Uh, most of that, I don't think there's much room uh, for us to provide recommendation to, but there is for the CPD topic list. So as we went through the CPD topic list, again, we looked at those things that are relevant to the committee, uh, not so much the things that don't apply to us, but we don't actually have that training material. So once we get that training material, uh, we need to uh, set a meeting, we'll review some of that, and then we would like to invite Commander Meter to the following meeting uh, to ask any clarification, any follow-up, any other uh, items that we have based on that material. And then our only two action items right now are just to acquire the material itself and uh, set our next meeting for uh, early 2019. Thank you. So, Ellen, is there anything you have that, that I missed? Nope. All right, and Jason, no, that's, that's our report. Thank you so much. 21st century policing, Dr. Jones. Yeah. Um, so the 21st century policing subcommittee, we also have only had one meeting. So we're, we're on trend here with the majority. <laughs> 
Um, but there were a couple of things that we did. Number one is um, like the uh, training group, we reviewed sort of what the topics came out of that discussion during the August meeting. Um, and then we also reviewed the PowerPoint presentation on 21st century policing. And then we delved a little bit deeper into focus areas of what our particular group is going to kind of hone in on. And so some of those included uh, scenario-based research, CIT training, um, assignments that officers have in a particular area. And then um, there was something else, Aletha, what am I forgetting? I think you're going right down the list. The, uh, did you already cover scenario-based research? Oh, the scenario-based research. I may have said that. Um, oh, the community-based listening sessions. That's what I missed. And so we actually discovered a lot of information. And we actually right now currently have a couple of recommendations, but we're going to research a little bit further. And she's not here, but I want to shout out Tracy because it is awesome having a police officer on our subcommittee. Um, and she gave some awesome recommendations, and then we paired that with some recommendations for her to do a little research. And she put together this comprehensive chart where she has compared our CPD with other law enforcement agencies and data and number, I mean, it's just remarkable. And then we delved a little bit deeper even to look at some of the things that dispatch is doing as well. And so I think we are right on target to give some good um, information recommendations, but we're gonna meet again to kind of go over all this information that we have acquired since then. So that's our action item. Um, and then um, we'll go from there. Aletha, did you wanna add anything? Uh, no. I think you or presented a comprehensive uh, analysis of what we did, or recap. Thanks. Thank you. And hot topics. All right. So I think I think we are we are the outlier on the other side in that we have not had any meetings yet. Well, let me give yep. share a reminder sure. to the commissioners. We had said that you probably wouldn't meet until we had completed. Uh, a lot of the overviews and would try to flesh out the hot topics. So you should not feel badly at all that you haven't met. That was the chair's call, okay? <laughs> and so on that, on that note, actually, um, one area that, that we would like the commission's help is actually in figuring out what the hot topics are. And so I've, uh, I've distributed a list, and it, I apologize, there's no heading on it, but it's a, it's a numbered list with various uh, lettered subpoints. And so this is a list that we generated originally when we had the tabletop conversations, and these were the potential areas that, that some commissioners had interest in. And so I'm not gonna go through all of these, but the, the five, five areas that, that we originally came up with, general issues related to new Americans, both for recruitment, but also um, kind of cultural awareness and training, um, officer health, potentially related to uh, things like uniform standards, et cetera, FOP contract provisions, um, CALEA standards, what, what it takes, what, what the, uh, what the process is for maintaining CALEA certification and kind of what the benefits are um, in juvenile justice. So since then, um, I think we, we've, we, we, well, I guess uh, we, we had, a, a, a Chairwoman Jackson and I had a conversation about how many of these should we focus on and is there any value added that we can bring? Are we duplicating work that the that consultant's doing, for example, it's likely that seniority-based promotion is not gonna go away no matter what we do. So how much time should we spend on that? benchmarking that with other departments that maybe operate in a different collective bargaining environment, things like that. So we, we would like, um, I guess, feedback from the rest of the commissioners about which of these topics we should keep, or is there anything missing from the list? And then we can meet as a, as a uh, subcommittee and, and, and kind of prioritize. So one other that I added that wasn't originally on the list, but I got kind of interested in after informal conversations with various folks is, thinking about data and, and how the department uses data and what the various systems are, and also thinking about officer productivity. So for example, there's at least anecdotally some, some complaints that since we've introduced body cameras, the amount of time it takes to write a report is longer because the officers have to review that, and that has impact on how many calls they can do in a single shift. So maybe getting a sense of whether those anecdotes are accurate, and if so, what the impact that is on productivity and the implications of that for staffing. Um, it's not obvious to me that the kinds of analysis that the consultant is doing comparing departments takes into account that. I think I also kind of got the impression that there's been some changes in the IT systems used. So for example, there's various uh, 
there's one system for doing dispatches, another system for writing reports, and there's a court system, and they don't all talk to each other. So the process for, do, for kind of combining them, is, it seems complicated, and that officers have to print out the reports and scan them in as PDFs, email them to themselves, and then upload it to the court system. And all of that has, obviously, productivity implications. So uh, we thought maybe that's one area where we could just get a better understanding of how the department works and thinking about are there specific investments that the city can make that you know, might, might have, a, have a big payoff. Thank you. Actually, there are a couple of topics on here, and I'll turn to the, to the full commission. We just have heard about Kalia, right? But no one actually presented on what it means for us to be a Kalia accredited department. And so. And, and also just what, what it takes, how many it, officers, right, and, the and, process, and what et it takes, Right. I think it might be worthwhile. Uh, I don't think it would take a, a long presentation time. Do you, George? I think that one is, is, if you, I would want us all to just hear that, and then if there was something in it where you wanted to delve deeper. So I would suggest that we do that. And then quite a while ago, we talked about the fact that we probably really wanted a presentation um, around juveniles. And I mean, that's been a couple of months ago, and it somehow fell off the list, I think. And so before you, delve too much into that. Let me talk with the internal team to see what that might look like, okay? Because um, again, I think, and it is different, uh, and I think it might be worthwhile for all of us to hear sort of a presentation around juveniles, okay? Great. And if I guess I could ask the other commissioners, um, maybe send me an email with feedback in terms of topics that are on here, how to prioritize them, and also maybe topics that are missing, or maybe subtopics for each of these topics that's missing. That would be, I think, most helpful for us as we meet and think about what, what we should focus on. Okay, thank you, thank you. It's great to see that the subcommittees are moving forward and working, thank you. Our next presentation today is on collective bargaining, and we are joined by Jennifer Edwards from the Baker Hosteller Law Firm. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Chairwoman Jackson, commissioners. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. You heard from my partner, Ron Linville, um, I think last month, perhaps, um, as well as Pam Gordon with the city attorney's office. Um, and that was as we were looking toward receiving a report and recommendation from um, the fact finder related to the FOP bargaining. We did receive that report. And so I was asked today to come in and talk to you about the fact finder's report and recommendation, as well as the process that has occurred since we received that. Um, as you know, Baker Hostetler and my partner, Ron Linville, um, represent the city of Columbus in the collective bargaining negotiations with the FOP, as well as with the other bargaining units within the city. Um, and that's why we are here with you. Um, I wanted to encourage you to ask questions throughout. Um, that's most likely to help us kind of focus in on what is of most interest to you. But I will run through the entire report and recommendation at a high level um, to make sure that we're all oriented. Clicker. All right, so the first thing we'll do is just, I want to reorient everyone to the, um, the impasse process, and then we'll talk about the report itself. Um, it sounds like you all have been doing a tremendous amount of learning, so congratulations on that already. Um, but hopefully this will focus us in a little bit on our conversation for today. So you may recall that um, the, fa uh, the fact finder was to issue a report and recommendations. Um, fact finder Goldberg did in fact do that. It was on November 27th that he issued his report and recommendations. We'll kind of start from the end and then go backwards on this. The legislative body or city council had, um, as well as the employee organization, so the FOP had seven days after the findings and recommendations were sent to reject the recommendations by a three-fifths vote. Um, that's a three-fifths vote of all of the voting members, um, not just a three-fifths vote of those who chose to attend. Um, neither rejected the fact finder's report and recommendations, so by statute, a collective bargaining agreement will be executed between the parties, and it will include the fact finder's report and recommendations. Um, because neither rejected, the parties do not need to submit to final offer settlement procedure, that conciliation that you all have discussed before. Um, I want to remind you that before fact-finding, the parties had agreed and closed bargaining on 21 of the 38 articles that are in the collective bargaining agreement or the contract, 
And then the fact finder, as in his report and recommendation, had to weigh in on 17 open articles. So it's important in this context to recall that um, if the FOP and the city had not, or had in fact rejected the fact finder's recommendation, the alternative would have been binding conciliation. Um, so as you recall from your prior presentation, the FOP's bargaining units are not, um, they're strike prohibited. So there's no opportunity for our officers, which is a good thing, to go on strike. Um, that means that then the parties are subjected to binding conciliation if they, are, if they do in fact reject a fact finder's award. Um, and the risk there is that the, a conciliator could choose um, something much more drastic than a fact finder does. Um, so in conciliation, Again, as you may recall, the conciliator has to decide on an issue by issue basis between the city's proposal and the FOP's proposals. So the easiest example, and this was not was what was at issue in our case, the easiest example would be if the city proposed a 0% wage increase and the FOP demanded a 20% wage increase, the conciliator would have to choose either zero or 20. It would have no opportunity to choose a compromise in between. And that would be the case on every single issue before the conciliator. So in this case, where um, we do believe that the conciliator or the, the fact finder issued a good, um, a good fact finding report and recommendations, um, it's important to remember that there was a lot to lose if either party had in fact rejected his report and recommendation. Any questions on that part of the process? All right, so what happened? As you may recall, the contract expired December 8th of 2017. The parties um, engaged in 22 sessions before we reached impasse. Um, we started bargaining in September of 2017. Um, by the time we were in front of the fact finder, as I mentioned, there were 17 open articles. We had six days of hearing in front of the fact finder, and he issued his report and recommendation on November 27th. After that, we um, briefed the administration, so we received the fact-finding report and recommendation. The bargaining team met um, together to say, to digest it and say, what do we think about this? We briefed the administration on, on the specific provisions within the fact-finders report and recommendation. Um, the, direct, the finance director's office put together a summary of the costs associated with it. We spoke with the division about the rule changes that are um, incorporated in here. And then from there, we sat with city council members to do the same. Um, the FOP, as you may recall, has two bargaining units. Um, neither, as I said, voted to reject. City council did not vote to reject. Um, and therefore, the report was deemed accepted as of December 4th. Um, because the report was deemed accepted, as I mentioned before, we're not going to move um, towards conciliation or binding arbitration. So one of the things I want to keep in mind, and I'm sure that this is my first time here, but I'm sure that you've had conversation along these lines, that making rule changes within a contract that has um, such a long bargaining history takes time. Um, there are a lot of the changes that, we, that the fact finder um, recommended this time that um, the city has tried to achieve over the last three, four, five bargaining cycles and has not made progress. So we're pleased that in this particular fact-finding report and recommendation, we were able to make progress on some areas that we believe are pretty important to the community as well as to the administration. with us. I am. Right. We're right there. So when we came to when we came to fact finding, um, we divided the contract because there was so much at issue. We divided it both into non-economic issues as well as economic issues. Um, I have economic issues at the back because I believe that your greater focus is on non-economic issues. Um, but and I know we have some limited time, so I'll dive right into non-economic issues. Typically, the non-economic issues are things like discipline, past practice, investigations, things along those lines. The way we've um, put this together for you all is we've identified a concern that we understood that the community and the administration had, and then what sort of change we were able to obtain through the fact finder's report and recommendation um, that addresses that concern. The first thing I'm going to talk about is um, citizen complaints. 
And one of the things that we had heard was an issue and thus we prioritized was that the CBA disqualified citizen complaints in certain circumstances. And specifically that a member of the community who had a complaint against a police officer only had 60 days to file that complaint. The fact finder recommended that we extend that deadline from 60 days to 90 days. Um, one thing I will tell you about the fact finder's report and recommendations, because we had so much at issue, um, he could have chosen to give us a 200 page decision with lots and lots of reasoning that we all had to kind of move through. But instead, recognizing that time was of the essence for the parties, he chose to issue a relatively brief fact-finding report and recommendation. So there's very little reasoning attached. So you will see in that, in that report that the city was seeking 120 days to file a citizen complaint. The FOP was seeking the status quo. The fact-finder really didn't say a whole lot about why he chose to, quote unquote, split the baby and land on 90 days, but that's where he did. All right, another non-economic concern we had was that the CBA limited discipline and oversight of officers. Um, obviously, this is something we've seen not um, discussed not only in Columbus, but nationwide. Um, so I wanna remind you of a couple things. Under the current exceptions to the citizen complaints, the collective bargaining agreement has that deadline, um, right? This, it has 60 days, what well, previously had 60 days, now we'll have 90. Um, but there were some exceptions to that. One was for criminal conduct on its face. Um, one was for anything that the city, the city attorney could reasonably um, believe would lead to criminal prosecution. And then there's a whole lot of language that essentially says anything that had result, any sort of conduct that had resulted in prior terminations. Um, the fact finder chose to create a new exception. And this new exception to that timeline is specifically focused on workplace misconduct. Um, so his, um, his new exception is if workplace misconduct violates the policy prohibiting discrimination in the workplace, then that is another exception to that 90 day timeline. And that was very important um, to the city and the administration because there was some pretty unusual restrictions on when a coworker could bring a complaint against a sworn officer coworker. Um, so now um, there's an ability for non-sworn employees of the division of police to file complaints against FOP members alleging discrimination in the workplace similar to other employee complaint processes. Um, so we were pleased about that. The next thing, um, and this requires me to say a little bit about kind of where things are. Yes, sir. So had this gone to conciliation, the, um, this person would not have had the ability to create this clause? What the, the person, cons I'm sorry. The conciliator sorry. would have had to have chosen from what was on the table? Well, it's, so it's a little different. The, the conciliator would have to, had to choose from what was on the table. The city had this on the table, um, and the FOP did not. So what the conciliator would have had to do was choose the city's position or the FOP's position. Here, the city had this on the table but with slightly different language. And therefore, what the fact finder did was take the concept, create his own language that he thought was clearer than what we drafted, um, and, and put that into the contract. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, sir. In, in this example of the report is discrimination defined to cover all forms of harassment and bias or just discrimination action or activity? So the way the way the fact finder worded this, it says policy prohibiting discrimination in the workplace. What that's going to refer back to is the city, the city not just the um, division's um, policy against discrimination in the workplace. And my understanding is that it's significantly broader than, for example, just we have Me Too up here, but it's much broader than just gender. It's also race, sexual orientation, sexual identity, gender identity, et cetera. Thank you. You're welcome. Am I? Cool. All right. Um, currently, um, there, so currently under the contract, there's the 90 days to, or, well, now there will be 90 days to file a citizen complaint. And then the division has 90 days from the date of the incident to investigate the complaint and may seek an additional 90 days extension from the FOP, which is not to be unreasonably denied. So typically what that means is the city has a total of 180 days to investigate a citizen complaint. Under the contract prior to fact finding, um, there was a prohibition on disciplining an officer if it were to take 
more than 180 days to complete that investigation. So it said you have up to 180 days, but no discipline may result um, if it takes longer than that. I'm sure you can understand that that was cause for concern. And so the fact finder um, eliminated that language. So now there's still 180 days if the extension is requested and granted. There's still 180 days to complete the investigation. And then if it takes longer than that, an arbitrator has the right to consider why. So if it took more than 180 days, the arbitrator can look at it and say, is that because there was a lot of data that needed to be reviewed? Is that because um, somebody had some sort of medical emergency so they weren't able to continue the investigation for a period of time? Or was it delayed unreasonably by the city? And so the arbitrator has all the options available to determine why that was, but the contract no longer precludes discipline if it takes longer than 180 days. Yes, sir. So who makes the request um, and who makes the determination um, after that first 90 days? Who makes the request for the extension? It's Commander Bodker. Okay. Yeah. Um, Can I ask a clarify question? Please. So it, it sounds like the ability to discipline after 180 days depends on the, what the arbitrator decides. If, if they decide it was reasonable or not. So the ability to discipline, there's no restriction on the ability to discipline, right? The city is able to issue that discipline beyond the 180 days up to however long it takes for them to decide that it's appropriate. The difference is, and this is the case in all, all arbitrations, the arbitrator has the right to look and say this was reasonable or not reasonable, just like the arbitrator has the right to look at the discipline and say this should have been a suspension or this should have been a written warning. Um, the arbitrator is always looking at all the facts and circumstances to determine what's reasonable. So it's a part of that overall analysis. Other questions? All right. Um, there was, so we had a lot of non-economic proposals on the table on behalf of the city. The FOP had a lot of proposals on the table on behalf of the members as well. The FO, I would tell you that I believe the city really received a lot more progress or achieved a lot more progress in this than the FOP, but the FOP did receive two particular tweaks um, through the fact finder's report and recommendation. The first is this. The FOP proposed that there should be a limited restriction on inspecting members' personal cell phones during investigations. So when would that arise? Only administrative investigations, so not criminal conduct, um, because remember, criminal conduct is an entirely different sort of investigation. Um, and But, and for example, if I'm being asked to, if I'm an officer and I was being um, asked questions about how I treated another officer or a member of the public that wasn't criminal, um, currently, or before this fact finder report, I should say, the, um, IA, the internal investigative unit, would be able to say we need to see your personal cell phone and we need to see what's on there. The FOP members had some concerns about privacy and their own constitutional rights there. And so what the fact finder did was a little bit of a give, um, but it's important that we hear this. In the absence of a search warrant, so it would never be um, related to a criminal investigation, or unless otherwise required by law, which protects the city's rights to and obligations to respond to public records requests, um, then personally owned cell phones or other personally owned electronic devices that are capable of storing personal data, so personal computers, are not able to be requested during the course of an investigation. Um, so that's the one thing that, um, one of the two things that the um, FOP receives some movement on. Any questions about that? So, <laughs> is it a question or a no, it's a question. <laughs> so, do you not have protections, constitutional constitutional protections against self incrimination, uh, like for your job, right? So, if it's your employer, because isn't that still self incriminating? And even if and even if it is a criminal investigation, how can you not have those? Because you produced the information, in all likelihood, on your phone. So shouldn't there be some still, some extension? Well, and that's, you're, you're exactly articulating the concerns that the FOP had. The F, so if I'm, if I'm a police officer, I do have a right against self-incrimination in certain circumstances, right? Um, when okay. this is only related to officers' cell phones. 
Um, mm -hmm. So it's very limited. It's related to officers' personal cell phones, not their work cell phones, but their personal cell phones. And they do have constitutional protections in their own personal cell phones. So that was the concern, and that's part of why um, the way that the um, fact finder worded it, I believe, is he says in the absence of a search warrant. Um, because at that point, that would change their personal protections. But I'll also tell you that some of this is a little beyond my constitutional knowledge, but we have others who can weigh in. And Richard from the city attorney's office will be covering that very issue. Okay. Excellent. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk a little bit about where that line with a public record is if you have two city employees talking back to each other on personal cell phones and just kind of shed some light on that question? So I can shed a little bit of light on that, and then I'll also defer to Richard. Um, so if under the public records law, if um, I am demonstrating as a public employee, if I am demonstrating or conducting bus the business of the agency on my personal cell phone, that can create a public record. Um, and so there will would end up being questions about whether I was conducting work of the agency on my cell phone or not. Um, and that's really why I think, again, that was an issue that the city raised, like, hey, we have public records obligations, and this could create some problems. Um, and I believe that that's why the fact finder put in unless otherwise required by law. And that would be something that everybody would have to kind of hash out about whether the city was entitled to those records or not. Is that fair? Um, so let's do this scenario. I and mean, you said the phone. So let's say it's Facebook, and you've got Facebook on your phone. It's your personal phone, and it is alleged that you, you know, as an officer, have made derogatory, discriminatory comments on your Facebook. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm just thinking that from watching national news that they have been disciplined for saying those types of things on their personal phones. Am I right about that? That does occur sometimes. There's definitely an opportunity to discipline based on off-duty conduct of public employees. I would tell you that I've done presentations on that that take about two hours. So I think it might be a little beyond the purview of this, but you are correct that that does occur. Okay. Our questions? Yes, sir. Question that may be directed uh, over here. Are all officers issued cell phones? At what level are uh, sworn officers, employees issued phones? Commanders and above are issued because they're exempt from overtime rules. Uh, we don't want to give them to officers because if they use them off duty, then we're obligated to pay them under Fair Labor Standards Act. Good. All right. So, a next concern. Um, there was, um, under the CBA, it limited the discipline and oversight of officers. And there was a particular provision within the contract, it's Article 10.4, that um, eliminated or really put the imposition of discipline on the lowest level of supervision. And so in attempting to address that issue, um, let me talk a little bit about how things would happen. Um, current or under the prior contract, um, positive correction, corrective action, DCCs, which are documented um, constructive counselings, and written reprimands had to be issued by the immediate supervisor. There had to be a decision, um, and then it had to be issued by the immediate supervisor. This created some concerns for the city um, because there was reason to believe that sometimes the, um, the person who works on a daily basis with an officer might be less likely to discipline, might be less likely to say, hey, this is something that needs to be reviewed by the chain of command. Um, what we were able to do was delete the requirement that the lowest level of supervision must issue discipline. Um, so we deleted the first sentence of 10.4. Um, additionally, um, once someone would issue a decision, a lower level officer would issue a decision, the contract had this interesting language that would require, if that was going to be changed, that the chief of police and those higher in the, in the chain of command had to demonstrate um, a reasonable justification for a different level of discipline. So, for example, if someone was issued a written warning 
a written reprimand, I'm sorry. And then that, the chief of police decided that a suspension was more appropriate. When an arbitrator was looking at that decision and trying to decide who to believe, the chief of police had an extra hurdle to overcome to demonstrate why her wisdom and judgment was stronger and should be given greater authority than what, say, a, a sergeant or a lieutenant did. Um, so we were able, and the fact finder deleted, um, that specific obstacle for the chief to overcome in an arbitration. Um, it also created, the fact finder also created an affirmative right for higher levels of the chain of command to review those decisions. Um, and we think that this is going to be particularly important in our disciplinary arbitrations um, because um, a lot of times what we hear is um, concerns about past practice and that, well, in the past, this, you know, lieutenants have always issued a DCC, a, a documented constructive counseling for these things. Um, and therefore, it's a past practice that this level of discipline is, receives a DCC. And then the chief would have to come in and say, well, maybe, but in this circumstance, it was much worse than what, um, what we've seen in the past. And she would have to create that, kind of overcome that burden. And now she won't have as great a burden to overcome in those circumstances. Yes, sir. So does this new process, does that stop at the chief or does that all the way up? Because I'm, I'm thinking of a case where the public, public safety director issued a harsher consequence than the chief and that became an issue in the arbitration. So th does that affirmative right go all the way up to the well, public safety director? Let me look at the language specifically. It, it ends up being with the final decision being made by the chief of police as currently. But what I'll tell you is there was a proposal, and we'll come to it in a second, the FOP made a proposal to um, try to limit the safety director's oversight of the chief's decisions. And we were able to hold the line so that the safety director retains the right to look at both suspensions and terminations and consider what would be appropriate. So it's a little different, but along the same lines. And, and actually, let's, um, I think it's a couple slides ahead, but we'll come back if to that. Follow. So if the, if the safety director wanted to issue a harsher consequences, there's still a requirement that they have to offer a justification of why they disagree with the chief? So that's a good question. It's a nuanced issue. So it kind of comes back, we were talking before about how an arbitrator looks at the facts and circumstances surrounding. What we've done is eliminate an artificial language barrier that was in the contract. So that language barrier was you must be able to demonstrate a reasonable justification. An arbitrator will still look at, hey, what happened in this particular circumstance? And do I think that what the safety director did, what the chief did, what the lieutenant did, do I still think that those are reasonable um, based on his, over, his or her overall analysis of the case? Just a real quick clarification on that. Yes. The, um, excuse me, the chief of police, the director, I'm sorry, is the pointing authority. The chief of police can make Dis disciplinary decisions up to leave forfeiture, but if there's a suspension, the only person that can implement a suspension is the director of public safety. So it has to go to the director to make that decision. Otherwise, the chief is allowed to offer leave forfeiture. It means 40 hours, say, you come out of your vacation bank, but the chief cannot issue it. At that point, it's just a recommendation to the director that a suspension be applied. I guess, I guess the, the scenario I'm thinking of is where the chief recommended, I think, three days leave, and then the public safety director recommended suspension or, or dismissal. I'm trying to think through how, how this applies in that kind of context. Rich is going to be talking about arbitration in a, in a little bit. He's going to cover that very issue. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. I'm so glad Rich is coming up next. <laughs> I know, you're just stuck. <laughs> All right, some other non-economic concerns. Um, here we go. This is exactly, um, this goes directly to your questions. It seems to not be on my printed version. So a couple of other things, as I mentioned, when we came in, right, the city was making particular proposals, as was the FOP. So our first obstacle in fact-finding was to make sure that the FOP um, didn't achieve movement in the direction that opposed what the city was trying to do, right? So we believe that holding the line on particular issues is very important. And then we were trying to, beyond that, make additional progress. So a couple of the places I wanted to highlight for you that we were able to hold the line as compared to some proposals made by the FOP. Um, we already identified we had a concern about the CBA limiting discipline and the oversight of officers. Um, the FOP wanted to limit 
um, the division's ability to bypass progressive discipline. So progressive discipline in certain circumstances, right? You would start with um, corrective action, you'd start with a DCC, you would, and then if somebody engaged in similar conduct, you would go from a DCC to a written reprimand. If the person engaged in similar conduct again, you might move them to a suspension. That's kind of the notion of progressive discipline. Under the contract, the, um, the chief is able to determine um, when there's um, allegations of misconduct of a crim that are of a critical nature, that she's going to bypass progressive discipline. So instead of starting at DCC and going to written reprimand, maybe she'd decide this particular issue or misconduct was of a critical nature, and therefore I'm going to issue a written reprimand on a first offense or a suspension on a first offense. Um, critical nature is currently undefined in the contract, which has allowed um, the division some latitude in deciding what is really critical or not. The FOP had proposed to define critical nature and to limit it to only those circumstances that had um, involved, it says, even in circumstances not normally, well, I guess it was in circumstances normally rising to the level of a suspension or a termination. So they wanted to limit when you were able to jump through, jump above on the progressive discipline scale. We were able to maintain the same language as there was before, which retains the division's rights to determine at what level would be appro a di appropriate discipline would be issued um, when there's misconduct of a critical nature. Yes, sir. What was the rationale there? Because from our perspective, it seems like as policing continues to evolve, as tech, new technologies are introduced, it seems that having that flexibility would benefit um, the, the people, ultimately, as they have the ability to um, <clears throat> identify new critical things that rise to that level as they emerge. So I don't know, what was your rationale? That's my only question. So our rationale was exactly that. So the city was saying we want to maintain the ability to have that flexibility as new things arise, and we want the division to be able to look and say this arises to a level of a critical nature, even though it's something that hasn't happened before or it's something that we couldn't have even foreseen two years ago, and now, um, now we know this is something people can do wrong. Um, the city was trying to maintain that, right? And the, um, the FOP was trying to restrict it. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, we also held the line, we talked about leave forfeiture, that the chief is able to issue leave forfeiture and, um, and then anything beyond leave forfeiture, so suspensions and terminations, the safety director has to weigh in on. Um, currently, the contract allows the chief to issue leave forfeiture up to 120 hours. Um, the FOP had proposed to increase that limit to 240 hours. Um, we were able to maintain the 120 hour limit. Um, so, ours, um, so we're able to keep it right where it is. And then finally, why, so why, why is that in the city's interest? Because that, why, why is it better to to keep it 120. Yeah. Um, so it's in the city's interest because what that means is anything that's the greater the number of hours, the more likely that it was egregious misconduct. So keeping it at 120, and some might argue that that's even too long, but keeping it at 120 means at least it's conduct that would only rise to the level of 120 hours um, leave forfeiture and not something that could be seen as much greater than that. You know, 240 hours is six weeks. So a six week suspension is typically gonna be very egregious. Helpful? All right. And then we maintained the safety director's right to issue suspensions. There was also the FOP had a proposal, which would have violated the city charter. Um, but the FOP had a proposal to limit the division's right to, and which would be the chief's right to issue suspensions. Um, I'm sorry, that would allow the chief to issue suspensions and eliminate the safety director's oversight of that. Um, and so we were able to maintain language that's consistent with the city charter. Good. Right. And if any, I know that I have a, a scheduled amount of time here. I apologize; it does take a little while, but I'm happy to keep running through it as long as it's well, useful and productive for you. you. There was a time for your presentation, and then a time for questions and answers. You're entertaining questions as we go along. Excellent. So the stop for this, including the questions, is 2:25. So okay. you've got about 30 minutes. I think we're making great progress. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, so next concern, the CBA erased misconduct records. 
Um, so let's start with how um, discipline is issued under the contract. Under the language in the collective bargaining agreement, prior to fact finding, discipline was issued and then it would remain active um, uh, for a period of time, and we can walk through those periods if it's helpful. Um, but it was issued, it would become effective as of the date of the incident that, that um, started the whole process. So I engage in misconduct today, um, let's say that I, as an officer, I was rude to a citizen. The citizen takes a period of time to come in and issue that, you know, raise that concern. It's investigated. Um, and let's say it takes four or five months for my discipline to be issued. Um, for example, a DCC, which is a documented constructive counseling under their contract, has nine months. If you, if I, if there was a complaint as of today, it took four months for for the whole process and the discipline to go out, my DCC would only remain active for an additional five months. You can imagine when we talk about progressive discipline that having that initial discipline only active for five months eliminates some of the ability to move from a DCC to a written reprimand, for example. Um, and that's all because it's issued, the discipline is based on the date of the incident. The city had a proposal to move that starting of the clock to the date of the issuance of the discipline. So if it takes five months for the citizen to come forward, for there to be an investigation, and for there to be a decision on what discipline is appropriate, the city decides it's a DCC, then not the beginning of that clock starts on the day that's issued, and now it really is useful for nine months for progressive discipline purposes. Um, the fact finder made a recommendation that we do that, but only for DCCs. Um, that's really the most important place that the change needed to be made because the timeline for that discipline is very short and that's where you start progressing. So cutting that out was eliminating a lot of the ability to progress. Um, and so the, the fact finder recommended that we start that clock as of the date of issuance. Um, the FOP had um, some proposals to reduce the retention and administrative use periods for discipline. So instead of um, nine months, they had proposed, let me get it right. Well, they had no change to DCCs for written reprimands. Um, there was a proposal to move it from, um, let me make sure I get it right. From three years, currently a written reprimand is active for three years in the contract or within a file. Um, and they had proposed to move it back to 18 months. And that kind of, they continued to propose reductions as far as suspensions and terminations as well. We're able to hold the line and keep all of those at the same periods that we're used to. Um, and then also, as I said, allow for greater use of progressive discipline by changing the date for the DCCs. Good? Okay. Okay. The next concern was related to the division's right to efficiently manage the workforce. So under Article 11.7 in the contract, the chief is not able to um, unilaterally create new job descriptions in certain circumstances. And that is um, in order to create job descriptions that include um, special skills, exceptional qualifications, and variable or rotating hours, the chief has to take that job description um, through the, uh, what's the first level? I'm sorry. Um, first has to take it to a committee that has to review and consult with the chief, and then takes it to the Labor Relations Committee. The Labor Relations Committee can stop the creation of a new job description. If the Labor Relations Committee, which includes FOP members, um, weighs in and, and says, no, we won't agree to the creation of this job description, the chief has no recourse. So where this becomes particularly important is when we're looking at, for example, policing, you know, current policing, we need different types of um, positions within the unit, not just street officers, right? But we need to be able to respond to critical incidents in particular ways. We need to be able to create perhaps more investigatory roles um, that have a technological component to the investigations that they'd be conducting. The chief has had great difficulty in trying to create those positions. So what we were able to do in this, um, in this fact finding report was create an appeal process for if the Labor Relations Committee does not approve of a position. 
So the chief brings it forward. Labor Relations Committee says no. The chief has now has the right to take that through an expedited arbitration process, take it to a third party neutral, and have the third party neutral decide whether the, um, the position description is appropriate. Is that good? Yes, sir. Oh, I think I'm, I think I'm tracking you, but this position description is for the position, not a different classification. So within, so if you're a lieutenant, oh, correct. the classification is still a police officer rank lieutenant. It's the description of the new assignment, essentially. That's correct. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Good. Okay. Um, so this should allow the division to make changes that are appropriate. We think even though it's, it, the chief would have to take it through an expedited arbitration process. What we hope is that it will allow both sides to really think about, is this something, is this position description something we really want to pay to go to arbitration over and you know pay lawyers and arbitrators and all of those folks to weigh in on? Or is there a compromise or a way that we could move this forward? So we think it'll help the parties come together in those situations. Good, all right. Um, this was, you, you may recall at the beginning, I mentioned there were two tweaks that the FOP was able to make some progress on. Um, the second is under Article 11, currently not related to Civil Service Commission testing. Um, so we're, I'm going to talk about testing, but it is not Civil Service Commission testing. That's something entirely different. But related to particular tests um, for job skills. And this might seem a trite example, but it's it's the easiest one I've come up with to explain. If I needed to be able, if I wanted to be the public information officer, there would be an appropriate job skill that I'd be able to speak in public. Um, if I wanted to do a particular job that required me to be able to create PowerPoint presentations, perhaps an appropriate job skill would be that I am, in fact, able to create PowerPoint presentations. So um, the, within the division, they are able to create tests for those, those sorts of job skills and administer those tests. The FOP had some concerns about whether those tests were necessarily measuring the right job skills and also whether there was test security around those tests. Um, and so they had a proposal to actually create um, a committee or allow this to go to a committee where they'd be able to stop the implementation of those tests, which you could imagine would create some inefficiencies for the division. Um, instead, what the fact finder chose to do was require the deputy chief in the same chain of command um, to take a look at a test before it's issued. And the deputy chief is going to review and approve that test um, and make sure that it fairly measures job-related skills, knowledge, and or abilities. So as much as this is in response to an FOP proposal, I'll tell you, I don't think that it's um, bad for the division. It's important that those tests really are measuring exactly what they're designed to measure. Um, so it just puts in one layer of supervision in that process. Questions on that? All right. Um, and then finally, there's currently a limit on um, when members, FOP members, are able to be selected for an assignment change. Those individuals who have an eight-hour suspension or more are not able to be selected for an assignment change. The FOP had proposed to move that not from eight hours to 120 hours or more, um, and we were able to hold the line on that and maintain that eight-hour suspension limitation. All right, let's talk a little marijuana. Um, so um, over the course of the collective bi bargaining cycle with all of the bargaining units, it was important that we update some of their drug and alcohol testing. The FOP was the last of the units to come to the table. Um, and so it was a priority for us to ensure that the FOP members are held to the same drug and alcohol testing standards as those um, who were represented and or not represented throughout the city. Um, so one of the things we took to fact-finding was the ability to include medical marijuana as an illegal drug um, unless there's a change um, under federal law that makes it a legal drug. So currently, um, before there was medical marijuana in Ohio, if you went for a drug and alcohol test and you tested positive for marijuana, you could be subject to um, the treatment process and or discipline under the contract. Um, there's been some confusion about what do we do uh, now that medical marijuana is allowed in Ohio but still remains illegal under federal law. 
So here, what we were able to do and what the fact finder recommended is that medical marijuana is still considered an illegal drug. Your officers are not to show up under the influence of medical marijuana um, unless federal law changes and marijuana is no longer listed on the um, Schedule One of the um, Controlled Substances Act. And that's consistent with what we have done with other employees throughout the city. Questions on that? All right. Um, yes, sir. One quick question. So an officer can't be on any um, controlled substance. Does that mean, so can you come on um, an opiate that you're taking for pain for your back or? It's illegal. No, I know that is. But, uh, but I'm really wondering, medication. but prescribed you can. So if it does not affect your ability to perform your duty. The directive requires that an officer, if they're impacted by it, report to supervisors so they are placed on restricted duty. Good. Good. Thank you. Um, then um, the Department of Trans, the Federal Department of Transportation regulations for commercial driver's license drivers have changed. Um, it used to be that to test positive for alcohol, so someone with a CDL that's driving a semi-truck, right, um, that to test positive, they would have to test 0.04, and then they would be subject to, it would be considered a positive test, and then subject to treatment or disciplinary processes. Um, recently, those um, those guidelines have changed, and they're, they're looking at individuals who test positive um, at 0.02 to 0.039. Um, and what we did here was ask that our police officers be held to the same standards as our CDL drivers. And so at 0.02 to 0.039, officers will be able to be sent home in a non-disciplinary capacity, but they will, they'll be precluded from then driving um, police cruisers and or operating weapons in that way. Good. All right, um, next non-economic concern. Um, the CBA provided FOP members with unfair access to information and contained barriers to full investigations um, was a concern that we had heard from the community as well as the administration. And in this area, we did not make significant affirmative progress, but we did hold the line on several proposals from the FOP that we believed moved um, in the wrong direction. Um, so currently, we held the line against FOP's proposal to provide greater rights to witnesses and the focus officer and in investigation. So one of the proposals um, was that the that IA would not be able to interview witnesses, um, FOP member witnesses, to in, um, some sort of conduct that's being investigated simultaneously. Um, and so we were able to hold the line and say, no, IA can make the decision about um, how or when it's interviewing witnesses to, to this sort of misconduct. Um, similarly, the FOP had a proposal to narrow what is considered the scope of an investigation. So there's um, constitutional law that, that defines um, what is an appropriate scope of an internal investigation based on misconduct. The city complies with that. The FOP proposed a definition of scope that was significantly more narrow and exceptionally co complicated. I don't know how anybody would actually implement that definition of scope. Um, and we were able to hold the line and maintain the same definition of scope that, that was contained within the contract before. And then finally, um, the, the proposal from the FOP, not only did they ask to unreasonably narrow it, but they wanted um, the contract to say that if IA exceeded the scope as it was defined, then an individual would not be able to be um, disciplined on the basis of that investigation. And we were able to hold the line on that as well, um, recognizing that we really ought to be disciplining when it's appropriate to do so. Okay. All right, that's the non-economic, um, that's the non-economic uh, movement we were able to achieve through the fact finders report and recommendations, and that's what will be included in the contract based on the fact that it's been deemed accepted by both parties. Any more questions on non-economic? All right, then I will briefly touch on economics because this is an important component, obviously. Um, one thing I would mention to you is um, when we moved into this and as we were briefing on behalf of the city, there were a couple of things we wanted to do. We wanted to keep the, the wages reasonable um, and fairly compensate our officers. We wanted to achieve some significant changes in the health insurance 
benefits that the officers receive in order to keep them more closely aligned with other coworkers around the city and within the market. Um, and then we wanted to make the economic changes. So we feel, or non-economic, I'm sorry, we feel good about the non-economic changes, but let's talk about wages and everything else, which we also feel good about. Um, so the fact finder recommended um, increased wages, 3% for 2017, 3% for 2018, 3% for 2019. You'll see for 2017, that's retroactive. There's a provision within the collective bargaining agreement that provides for retroactive wage increases. Um, so that will the, the individuals will receive that 3% going back to December of 2017, which is when their contract expired. Um, it created a new F step. So the police officers currently work through a step system. They're a new officer, and then they, achieve, they um, receive an additional wage increase after a year of service, after two years of service, after three and after four. That's currently the E step. The fact finder created a new step where there will be an additional wage increase for officers who um, end their ninth year of continuous service. And the reason for that was that the city of Columbus officers, when you compare them to local um, bargaining units, kind of in central Ohio, um, that they're not at the top of the pack and they're not really at the middle of the pack currently, they're more towards the bottom. And so the fact finder thought that it would be appropriate to try to move them towards the center. Um, and then there's something called a rank differential. So if I'm a, if I am a sergeant, then I make a certain percentage over what the highest police officer makes. Um, if I'm a lieutenant, I make a certain percentage over what a sergeant is paid. And so that percentage is 18% between the ranks. That's called a rank differential. Um, the fact finder looked and said, okay, I, I, on the... Um, Police officers, maybe they're falling behind a little bit from a wage comparable standpoint um, when we look at local jurisdictions, but the promoted ranks are making more um, than, than the comparable jurisdictions. So instead of keeping that rank differential at 18%, the fact finder, um, for those who are promoted to lieutenant or commander on or after January 1 of 2020, that rank differential will shrink to 15%. Questions? All right. Um, the, a long time ago, it became um, common practice for um, public employers to pick up a part of the employee's pension contribution to their appropriate um, pension fund. So under statute, there's a particular percentage contribution that an employer must make on behalf of its employees. And there's a particular a portion that is considered the employee share. Um, and the city of Columbus, along with many, many public employers over the years, picked, picked up a part of what the, empl the employees share. Um, when we entered into fact finding, the city was picking up one and a half percent on behalf of the officers. Over the course of the last several bargaining cycles, the city used to pick up at least 10 percent, perhaps more. Um, and that's been something we've been negotiating away so that employees are really responsible for their own portion of the pension. Um, and so we have now, we were at 1.5 percent. The um, fact finder decided to split that in half. Um, so he reduced the city's pension pickup of the officer share, the member's share, 0.25% in 2018 and 0.5% in 2019. So under the current, under the new collective bargaining agreement, by the end of it, the city will be picking up 0.75% of the employee's share of, the, of their pension contributions. Um, and then we'll see what happens going forward. And then shift differential, which is additional premium pay that individuals who, the easiest way to describe it is work kind of second or third shift. They make a little bit more money based on the inconvenience of being on those shifts. Um, the city has been at 90 cents per hour for a very long period of time. And the fact finder looked at the comparable, comparable jurisdictions and decided that their shift differential should be increased to $1.25 per hour. I'll tell you that's very consistent with what we see within central Ohio. Um, so kind of put them right back in the middle of the pack on shift differential as well. All right, we could spend about 72 hours just talking about insurance. So I'm going to give you the real high level here. Um, but I did mention to you that it was important to the city to obtain um, 
you know, strong changes on insurance. Um, and the fact finder recognized that. He recommended significant changes to the health insurance prescription drug plans. Um, we've redesigned their insurance plans. Um, they have increased cost sharing and increased premium contributions. Um, and so their plan looks much more like the plans for the individuals um, throughout the city as compared to what they had originally, which was a very unique plan just for themselves. Um, so now they're being treated much more similarly to those um, throughout the city. All right, questions on economics? You good? <laughs> so sure. the, is there a, there's a separate contract for officers versus uh, the um, promoted ranks, correct? That is correct. Okay. And mean, that's required by law. Right, right. right. Your, your colleague, I believe, uh, yep. covered that. But, but my question becomes, so do these changes affect both of those contracts? That's a great, that's a great question. It does, they do. They, they affect both. Um, the FOP has generally negotiated both of those bargaining unit contracts together um, and chose to do so here. The bargaining units had the opportunity to, to vote separately and are required to vote separately. Um, so it could have been the situation where the promoted ranks um, voted to reject and the um, police officers chose not to or vice versa, but instead here they both um, voted not to reject. And so all of the changes apply to both bargaining units. It's a great question. Yes, sir. Just curious, do you know what the, what the vote totals were in each, each bargaining unit? No, I don't. All right. Any other questions? A question, although I don't know if you can answer this one or not, just sure. kind of sparked. But you're talking about officer salaries. Is there somewhere where we can go, we as the public can go and see any public safety member's salary? Can you guys tell me yeah, where? It's on the, it's on the city of Columbus uh, site. You can look up the FOP contract or the uh, MCP uh, contract, uh, management contract, and all the pay rates are uh, publicly available right there. Well, I guess. Oh, so that, that's helpful. Um, can I see, I'm not picking on you, but can I see yours or can I see Director Speaks individually, what, not what your classification or rank makes, but what you make? Public record. I mean, is, okay, I agree. Um, so I work for the state of Ohio. So if you go on the treasurer's website, you can type in my name and see exactly how much I make, right? right. Is there a comparable system for the city is what I'm asking. Business first actually has, I think, all the Central Ohio. Uh, likewise, for the state of Ohio employees, there's another website called it's the, it's the Treasurer's Office. The Treasurer's Office, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. so the, other, the other thing you can also do is, I believe, CERB, State Employment Relations Board, keeps contracts for every bargaining unit in the state. Uh, I don't know if they put those online or not, but I do know that they have every bargaining unit. So if you're interested in like what the city of Whitehall play, pays its police department, you can take a look at that contract that way. And those are um, available electronically on SERB's website, okay. uh, all the current you contracts. You said it was business first? Yes. Thank you. Then thank you for thank your you. presentation today. Thank you very I much. Very your informative. Time. So we're actually, no, oh, we're right on time. Um, 2.20, it's time for our break. We'll resume at 2.35. Our next presentation is on, oh, the presentation that you just saw, um, Elon mentioned we just got it today, so it will be emailed to you, the one on um, collective bargaining. So can we actually get a copy of the whole, um, of the whole report from the, is it arbitrator or fact finder? You folks have too much time on your hands, but I'm, Is I'm it sure the. Hmm? It's a public record. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it is. Um, Lieutenant, are you ready to proceed? Yes, ma'am. Please go. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Tim Myers. I'm a lieutenant with the Division's Professional Standards Bureau. Um, if you haven't realized it already, um, the Division of Police is a very multi-layered onion, and you're, you're starting to peel back these layers. I don't know if you realize that when you uh, agreed to do this, but I, I've gone to a couple of these meetings, and I have to commend you for uh, the incisiveness of your questions, and I'm sure you're realizing now how complicated and nuanced 
some of this is. So allow me to add another layer of <laughs> complication and nuance. Uh, some of what I'm going to talk about you heard briefly from Jen, and you're also going to hear a little bit more from Rich later in the uh, afternoon. Let's uh, do some introductions here. Um, there are two of us in the Discipline and Grievance Office for the Division of Police. Our job is to advise uh, the Chief of Police and other decision makers in the division about uh, just cause issues, disciplining officers, and then also dealing with grievances uh, from the FOP under our collective bargaining agreement. The two of us in the office are uh, Lieutenant uh, Van Irwin. He's here with me today. He has 20 years in the Division of Police. He was an attorney in private practice before he came to the division, finally saw the light. And uh, he's been in his current assignment for five years, so he brings a lot to the table as far as experience. Uh, I have been with the division for 10 years. I would, uh, have an undergrad uh, degree in criminology from Ohio State, uh, law degree from Capitol, and I'm a graduate of the Northwestern School of Police Staff and Command. And I've been in this assignment for a little over a year. This is our contact information, and I'll probably say it a couple times uh, while I'm up here. If you have questions about any of our cases, anything we've dealt with, give us a call, email us. Uh, we're happy to talk about it. We're sort of off in our own little corner uh, up on the eighth floor of the division. People don't usually come over to talk to us too much, so we're lonely. So if you have questions, you want to talk about something, uh, give us a call. As long as it's a, a case that's closed, that's not still subject to litigation, be happy to talk to you about it. All right, this is where we're going. We're going to talk about some principles of discipline, just big, broad uh, concepts. We're going to talk about the levels of discipline in the Division of Police, how we can retain and use those records. We've kind of touched on that a little bit already. We're going to highlight the process, and then I'll get into some statistics about what we actually discipline officers for. So why is this important? Uh, a couple reasons, I think. Uh, externally facing out to the community, I think this is important because y'all are stuck with us. Uh, this is the only division of police for the city of Columbus. If you call the police in Columbus, you're getting one of us. There's nobody else you can call, so we owe it to you to make sure that we set and maintain high standards. Internally, it's important that we are fairly disciplining officers. Uh, hopefully by now all of you have at least had a chance to page through the uh, President's Commission on 21st Century Policing Report. Um, one of their recommendations as it relates to uh, sort of transparency and legitimacy is promoting procedural justice internally uh, with the police department. The idea being that promoting procedural justice internally will help promote that externally as well. I mean, if we are treating our employees in an arbitrary or capricious manner, how could we expect them then to turn around and treat citizens fairly and equitably, right? So that's why it's important um, for us. When we talk about discipline, we're talking about a couple of different things. First, discipline's a core value for us. It is that important. And our core value says that it's exhibiting proper conduct and self-control in the face of adversity, through a commitment to training and organizational standards. So that's sort of big D discipline, uh, core value. We also have sort of little d discipline, and that's the process uh, by which we make sure that our employees are performing up to standard. We also have this thing that kind of uh, rears its head. It's called positive corrective action, and that's pretty much everything outside of discipline that we use to modify officer behavior, to achieve voluntary behavioral modification. You heard this before. In the Division of Police, we have the concept of progressive discipline. Generally speaking, uh, discipline has to go from least intrusive to most intrusive. So it starts with what's called documented constructive counseling for a first or low-level offense. And then that can progress up to a written reprimand then we start getting into suspensions or demotions. Uh, there's also potentially an option for leave forfeiture in there for certain cases. And then after that, we get into terminations. And there is a presumption under the collective bargaining agreement that we will follow this progressive process, unless, as Jen mentioned, there's critical misconduct. What's a leave forfeiture? A leave forfeiture, great question, Director. Leave forfeiture is uh, 
an option that the chief of police has uh, where instead of a suspension, the chief can offer that the employee forfeits a certain amount of accrued leave up to 120 hours. Jen talked about how the FOP wanted to increase that uh, to a higher limit. It's still at 120 hours under our collective bargaining agreement. The chief does not have to offer leave forfeiture and the employee does not have to accept leave forfeiture. We've had cases both where the chief has decided not to offer it even though it's under that 120 hour threshold and cases where even though the chief offered it, the employee decided not to accept it. A reason an employee might not accept leave forfeiture is if you accept leave forfeiture, the case is done. That's the end of it. Um, and if an employee wants to challenge their discipline uh, in front of an arbitrator, they have to go see the director first. So they will reject the leave forfeiture, go see the director, and if the director sides with the chief, then they potentially take it to arbitration. Just cause is something that was touched on a couple months ago. I think Rich will probably get into it a little bit as well, but it's that important. Just cause is a requirement of our contract. All discipline under section 10.1 of the contract has to be for just cause. Um, and the contract provides sort of the highest levels of protection when we're talking about this. But there are other levels. There's also a constitutional floor um, whereby you know, the Supreme Court has said that if state law creates a property right in, in your job, which most civil service employees have, then you can't be deprived of that without due process. So this concept of just cause talks about that. Over the course of years, arbitrators have come up with certain tests for just cause. And the most typical formulation is right here, uh, the seven tests for just cause. And these are the things that when an arbitrator is evaluating discipline that we've uh, meted out, they're going to evaluate these seven factors and figure out whether we've met this test. Importantly, in a discipline case, we, the employer, bear the burden of showing this. So it's on us to show that we have met all seven of those tests. Perhaps a, a interesting thing to think about at this point is what's on there and what's not. So notice, that means that we have to provide adequate notice to the employee of what is prohibited and what is allowed. Reasonableness in the rule. That rule can't just be arbitrary. It has to be uh, rationally related to uh, some important business mission. Thoroughness of the investigation. If we're going to discipline somebody, we have to do a thorough and fair investigation to the next point. There has to be proof that the underlying conduct was substantiated. We have to treat employees, this says equally, I would say equitably, is probably a better term. And the penalty that we eventually levy has to be related to the severity of the infraction. It's interesting what's on there, but it's also interesting, I think, what you don't see on there. Um, because these aren't the only things that our leaders have to think about. I have the luxury as a discipline agreements lieutenant, I sort of sit off on my own corner, right? And I'm not part of internal affairs. I don't do investigations. I'm not part of the chain of command. I don't make the decisions. My job is to evaluate the case objectively and provide advice. So I get to sort of say whatever I want, you know, when I'm giving that advice. Um, but we are very aware that these are not the only things that leaders have to think about. Where up there in the seven tests of just cause is community concerns. It's not up there. Maybe you can shoehorn it into reasonableness in the rule, but it's not really there. Still something that our leaders think about when they make their decisions, but when it goes to arbitration, when these are challenged and an arbitrator is looking at our decisions, this is what they're evaluating. So this is uh, the retention and use of our disciplinary records. Jen touched on this. This is it in sort of visual form, maybe uh, help things click a little bit. This includes the change to the latest collective bargaining agreement where the documented constructive counseling is going to stay in their file for nine months after it's issued rather than after the date of the misconduct. Any questions on this? So this data that I'm going to start getting into is pulled from our disciplinary tracking system. 
which is something that is required by our collective bargaining agreement. And in about 2012, we moved from an old DOS-based system uh, that was just uh, horrible to use to a slightly more user-friendly version in our uh, current records management system. And so a lot of these statistics are from this new system. It's much easier to pull data out and show you what the trends are. So from about 2012, because there are probably a couple 2011 cases that are in this number as well, uh, we have had 2,218 DCCs issued that are in the disciplinary tracking system. That's a lot. Keep in mind, we have 1,900 employees. Yes, sir? I have a question. Does this include the ones that are past the retention period, or is this only the ones that are still within that retention policy period? <clears throat> Great question. So this does include ones that are past the retention period, because for tracking purposes, once the retention period has passed, we redact the employee's uh, identifying information, and we keep the record of the discipline in the tracking system itself. Uh, and we do that so that when we're trying to figure out where to go with a new case, we can see where we've been. Excellent question. And that does bring up something I did want to clarify from a couple meetings ago. There was some discussion about what the contract requires as far as removing discipline from files uh, compared to public records. And I feel like the commission might have been left with the impression that there's some, once the discipline is taken out of the person's file that there's some other sort of secret file uh, that it's kept in for a while. Under the contract, uh, taking it out of the uh, employee's personnel file means destroy. And destruction is mirrored to the public records retention schedule. So as a point of practice, once that timeline for uh, retention is hit, it's pulled from the file and it's sent out to the records warehouse for destruction. So I just I didn't want you to be left with the wrong impression on what happens in practice. All right, so about 2,200 DCCs, 422 written reprimands. About half of those are fleet safety. So those are sort of, it's almost a separate process from traditional discipline. And that is when officers get into uh, accidents in their vehicles and are found to be at fault. There's a couple things that can happen out of that. Uh, they can get documented constructive counseling, they can get written reprimands, and they can also get traffic tickets. That's sort of a whole separate process, um, but that accounts for about half of those written reprimands. Next, we have 103 uh, suspensions or leave forfeitures, followed by, you're probably not even going to be able to see it on the slide, it's like a single pixel, eight terminations. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, more people than that haven't left uh, during this time period. It is uh, not unheard of for people, if they are facing serious discipline, to resign in lieu of termination before it even gets to the chief's level, and those cases aren't captured here. So th that sort of thing does happen, but these are cases where the chief has recommended termination and gone forward. So one of the things that I find interesting about this is how steep the pyramid is, right? Um, 2,200 DCCs, very few of those are getting progressed to written reprimands. And that's interesting to me because when you really think about it, what is documented constructive counseling? It's, it's a piece of paper that says you did a bad thing and here's what we're doing to correct your behavior. But really, practically, it's a piece of paper. What's a written reprimand? It's a different piece of, actually, excuse me, it's the same piece of paper with a different box checked that says you did it again and we're serious, right? But what's interesting about that is because we're not having those cases progressing from DCC to written, what that's telling me is that in a lot of cases, we are successfully modifying officer behavior with a piece of paper. A lot of places, uh, places maybe you've worked in the past, you don't really start affecting employee behavior until you start taking money out of their pockets, right? Until you start suspending them, giving them days off, even firing them. That's when you start affecting their behavior. For whatever reason, and, and it, hopefully it's something that we can hold on to, we have a culture of discipline in the division where, I mean, these pieces of paper matter to officers. Uh, they uh, are 
very, you know, they, they uh, file grievances over documented constructive counselings. They feel if they feel like they have been issued one unfairly, they will um, avail themselves to all the contractual processes. It it matters to them, and I think it's because by nature we are rule followers, and we don't like to be told that we did a wrong thing. And uh, I really hope that you know, as the division of police progresses, is that we don't lose that. Here's another way of looking at that. So here's all of our discipline over this time period, uh, 2,700 uh, instances of discipline. Of those, only 198 are what we would call, you know, potentially serious. The way I got that number was I looked at you know, all the discipline we've issued versus the number of cases that we in the discipline grievance section have been asked to weigh in on. Not all of those end up with serious discipline. Sometimes we look at a case and we say, yeah, this can go the normal route. Um, and the leaders who are making the decisions agree. But these are cases where at least someone had an inkling that maybe this is a serious case and we need a third party review of it. So again, that's a, that's a pretty big uh, uh, disparity there, I think. Yes, sir? So what's the criteria definition of a serious versus routine case? I love it. It's almost like, are you a plant? Did I pay you? Can you, you can tell them. It's fine. OK. Uh, next slide is going to explain exactly that, I think. Uh, and if I don't, then just raise your hand again. All right. So. All of these start out with an investigation, right? Because we can't just discipline somebody without conducting a thorough and fair investigation. Those are two elements of just cause. So these all start with an investigation. One thing I want to point out to you is that that investigation could come from multiple sources. It could be internal affairs in the case of a citizen complaint, but it could also be the officer's chain of command. Very often the operational chain of command will conduct administrative investigations into you know, use of the force, things like that. If the chain of command or internal affairs or whomever is uh, conducting this investigation concludes that there's a potential violation of our policies, then uh, they will make a recommendation. That starts with the immediate supervisor. We talked about why that was when uh, Jen was up here. And that recommendation will go up the chain of command to the employee's deputy chief. Now there are some things that the employee's immediate supervisor can just make a decision on, say, hey, I'm going to issue documented constructive counseling too. But the big things, by policy, we have withheld that decision-making power to the deputy chief level. So things like internal affairs complaints, right? The deputy chief has the final say on those. Um, pursuits, um, uses of force, things of that nature. You're not going to get disciplined out of that without somebody up to the level of deputy chief having weighed in on it. So recommendations go up the chain of command. And when they go up the chain of command, the supervisors, if they're doing their jobs correctly, should be making a recommendation and backing it up with sound reasoning that's related to the facts of the investigation. And we do this um, probably much to the chagrin of our lawyers on a physical routing sheet where we explain, yes, the officer did wrong, and here's why I think the officer did wrong. Right? So we put it down on paper um, because we owe that to the public. If we did something wrong, we need to own it and correct it, right? So those recommendations go up. Generally speaking, the deputy chief makes a final determination right there and then. If it's routine discipline, something not of a critical nature, then the deputy chief will say, yes, go ahead and issue discipline, and it goes right back down the chain of command. The discipline's issued and then it's routed to personnel for tracking and um, to internal affairs for storage. Sometimes, and this is getting uh, to your question, sir, the deputy chief will determine, um, again, in consultation with the chain of command, that maybe this conduct is more egregious than normal, and maybe it requires deviation from progressive discipline. If that's the case, then the deputy chief will send it over to us. 93% of the time, that's not the case. 93% of the time, it's sort of routine discipline where the deputy chief makes a determination as to what it is and the discipline is issued at the low level. If they decide that 
is potentially serious, then the deputy chiefs will send it over to our office for what we call a just cause review. And that's where we take another look at the investigation. We look at um, the thoroughness of it, uh, what facts can be proven from it, the likely arguments that are gonna be made you know, in an arbitration. We look at some arbitration awards to see if there are any potential constraints on how we're gonna prove our case, things like that. And then we have a conversation with the involved deputy chief about the strengths and weaknesses of the case, about what we've done in similar circumstances in the past. The deputy chief will then take that and present that information to the chief of police, uh, usually at our executive staff meeting, but uh, it can also be offline. The chief of police is the one who has to approve deviation from progressive discipline. So if the chief of police decides, uh, I just, yes, this person should get a written reprimand instead of a documented constructive counseling, go ahead, right? She can approve that and send it back to the deputy chief, right? And then it gets issued in the normal, normal way. If the chief decides, again, in consultation with the chain of command, that departmental charges are warranted, then this next process kicks in. Uh, departmental charges are sort of the next formal step in discipline where we start having hearings because we're potentially going to be taking money out of your pocket um, by, you know, suspending you, demoting you, or firing you. So when an employee is departmentally charged, they're uh, served with uh, the charges against them to give them notice about what they're being charged with, and then they are given an opportunity to be heard by the chief of police. At that meeting, uh, the employee will many times be represented by the Fraternal Order of Police, although employees can choose to appear at the hearing unrepresented. That happens from time to time. But uh, they have this predisciplinary conference with the chief of police, and then the chief of police makes a decision and issues a recommendation. Again, if that recommendation is for 120 hours suspension or less, she has the option of offering leave forfeiture. She does not have to do that, nor does the employee have to accept. If she doesn't offer it, or if the employee decides not to accept it, it goes to the Director of Public Safety. That's uh, Section 108 of the City Charter says that the director has the final say on suspensions, demotions, terminations of police officers. So it goes over there for another hearing, and that's where one of us in the discipline grievance section will represent the chief's office in that hearing. Someone from the uh, FOP will usually represent uh, the officer, and the final decision is made by the director of public safety. Can yes, sir. You, can you give us some intuition for why the chief might decide to offer or not offer leave forfeiture rather than a suspension? Uh, intuition as to why she might decide to offer leave forfeiture as opposed to a suspension. Well, um, I guess there are sort of, there are secondary consequences to an employee serving a suspension. So if I serve a suspension of say three days, like 24 hours, relatively low level suspension, but if I serve that suspension, I am now three days less senior than everybody else in my class who I graduated with, or if I'm in the promoted ranks, everybody else that I was promoted with on that day. So my seniority might decrease by the number of days of the suspension I serve. So that's sort of a collateral consequence. Um, and what's the significance of your seniority? So uh, the question was, what's the significance of the seniority? Uh, in the Division of Police, it's very significant. Seniority has a very high bearing on the type of jobs that you can uh, successfully bid for. So it's uh, something, it, it it can be very impactful to officers, especially to officers, because if there were 50 people in your academy class, and let's say you graduated you know, in the top five, and now you serve a couple days of suspension, you're gonna fall to the bottom of that 50, which could delay you getting a, you know, a coveted assignment uh, during daylight hours or um, in a detective bureau by quite, quite a lot. So uh, that's a consequence of it. Um, leave forfeiture to an extent also essentially allows you to defer the consequences of your bad action potentially all the way to retirement, right? Because it, you're giving up accrued leave, so there is a penalty to it, but you might not feel it until it's time to get that leave paid out, which might not be until you're retired. So not offering leave forfeiture is a way that the chief can probably stay within 
comparable limits, right? Because not everything deserves a high-level suspension, right? But maybe there's something about this case that, you know, deserves a little bit more emphasis. And so that might be a reason. So what do we discipline officers for? Well, we have the division, we have 51 rules of conduct. And these rules of conduct are our broad precepts of authority, and they carry the full force and effect of a direct order from the chief of police or the director of public safety. Uh, and that is how we base our discipline. Every uh, discipline case is gonna relate back to a rule of conduct. The city work rules still apply to the division of police, um, but generally speaking, our discipline is based on these rules of conduct, which are a little bit more police specific. I'm gonna show this information to you in a couple different ways. This is by the numbers using the discipline tracking system, uh, the most common rules of conduct that officers are disciplined for. This gives it to you visually for you visual learners, but here it is uh, broken down in a uh, table. So the most common thing that we discipline officers for is violation of our policies, rules, and directives. And that's very simply because we have a lot of policies, rules, and directives. I don't know if you've all seen a physical copy of them. Um, there are quite a few of them. And so when officers violate those, be it uh, a directive or standard operating procedure for their bureau, they can be disciplined for that, and there's a rule of conduct that we use to do that. So that far and away is the most common. Uh, the next most common is care of division property. Almost all of those are fleet safety. That's crashing your cruiser into something or someone crashing into you and it's your fault. Um, that's what most of that discipline is. You take fleet safety out of it and that number falls considerably. We still do discipline officers for um, you know, losing uh, division issued items, uh, causing negligent damage to property and, and things of that nature. Under the general requirements, there are several flavors of general requirements. The most common that we discipline officers for is rude and discourteous behavior. Obedience to laws and ordinances, uh, rule of conduct 101. Oh, I'm sorry. Just a question, um, so I'll go up to, the, to, to, the, um, to your first one, and then as you're going down to general requirements. So they are very broad, and, and you said they're broad. Is there a way that you can extract which rule or which directive or which requirements? I mean, can you, can you sift it through that specific to determine if there's any trend of rule or directives that are struggles for officers or are hot issues for officers? Uh, yes, ma'am, we can. One limitation to that is it's sort of garbage in, garbage out. So if the issuing supervisor doesn't put an on-point directive uh, when they're issuing that, you know, rule of conduct 1.03 uh, DCC or written, uh, if they don't put the correct one, then it makes it harder to analyze, makes it a little bit noisy, but we, we can and we do. Um, some of the most common uh, are um, uh, related to our cruiser video system um, and, our, well, our video systems in general as far as, um, we used to have a, uh, an issue with officers sometimes not wearing their microphones um, or not activating the microphones when it was just the uh, cruiser video system. Uh, that was a common one. Uh, uniform appearance, we still do discipline officers for not wearing their hats when they're supposed to, um, things like that. Emergency vehicle operations, that's another one that's commonly disciplined under uh, 103. So that's driving unsafely for conditions, not using lights and sirens like you're supposed to. Anything else? Uh, obedience to laws and ordinances, most of those are off-duty OVIs, drunk driving by officers. that are not off-duty OVIs? Oh, it's a smattering of things. Um, one officer was disciplined because he apparently got intoxicated and um, uh, walked up on the freeway, which is against the law. Um, one officer was, I think, fishing without a license or something like that. Um, those are still violations of the law. Um, the more serious ones are, you know, officers soliciting prostitutes, 
uh, while they're on duty, dereliction of duty, stuff like that, the, the doozies. Um, those I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, but generally, if we're, it's something where the officer has pled guilty or been convicted of a violation of the criminal law. Or receives a traffic citation off duty in or out of jurisdiction is that part of the discipline grid no no thank you all right uh, use of firearms uh, almost all of those are negligent discharges of the firearm so that's officer loading or unloading the shotgun at the substation um, things like that uh, so 34 of the 39 that we uh, charged under that rule of conduct were negligent discharges. Uh, and then uh, requirement to take action, a lot of those are failure to arrest. So circumstances where officer, you know, knew somebody had a warrant, didn't arrest them like they were supposed to, didn't verify the warrant like they were supposed to, um, or, you know, had probable cause to arrest someone for drunk driving, for example, and failed to make the arrest. Uh, any questions about that list? Yes, sir. If, if, I, if I'm an officer, I, I stop somebody without a driver's license, but I don't issue a citation, would that fall under that category, or is this only arrest and above that doesn't include citations? A category of what? For uh, requirement, requirement to take requirement action? To take action yeah. That would probably be issued under requirement to take action, but there's also a policy related to traffic violators that you would be violating when you do that. Mm -hmm. And so that's where it gets noisy because the supervisor could elect to discipline as a rule of conduct 103 and cite the directive, right, instead of the requirement to take action. Does that kind of make sense? Anything else on this list? Sir. So I have something that kind of goes back to the DCC. So are these the offenses, more or less, that you would get a DCC for? Uh, no, not necessarily. So. I guess I'm going to give you the lawyer answer here. It depends. Yeah, because I'm just. <laughs> so, right, to your point, uh, some of these, so violations of rules and directives, most of those are going to be DCCs because uh, of the sort of low level nature of what most of those rules are about, right? But, you know, violating the law, very often that results in deviation pro from progressive discipline and departmental charges. Correct. Right? I'm sorry? Critical. Yes, that would be critical misconduct, right? So this is just a breakdown of generally uh, what we do. I'm going to show you later some charts on what we actually sustain departmental charges for. So this is everything that officers are disciplined for. And then later you're going to see the most common things that we in the discipline grievance office actually uh, bring forward to charges and that the chief of police actually sustains at departmental charges to where we're talking about you know, generally suspensions, leave forfeitures, demotion, termination, things like that. So then just one more quick follow-up. So the, you said seniority uh, impacts your ability to get promoted or uh, secure uh, prime uh, job opportunities, but what about these DCCs and written reprimands? Do they also imp impact your ability to get promoted? And which one weighs more heavily? So I'm going to try to stay in my lane here. Uh, there is a process by which promotional candidates are screened. And one of the things that they are screened for is their past discipline within the timelines. So um, it, it doesn't affect sort of your rank on the eligible list, right? Because that's the, based on the civil service test. But it may affect your ability to actually be promoted when it's sort of your time on the list, right? because uh, the, the eligible list comes out and we start working our way down the list as we have vacancies, there is a process by which those promotional candidates are screened. And so in that process, if you have uh, severe enough discipline or enough discipline, uh, it might be the case that you are not promoted by the appointing authority based upon that screening process. Right. And, and so my question was just about the pyramid that we looked at earlier mm -hmm. about the significance of those 2,218, I believe it was, um, DCCs that didn't rise to the level of written reprimand. So there's kind of an incentive to make it right um, so that you don't rise to the next level in the progressive discipline process. Absolutely, because once you do end up with, you know, say, a, a written reprimand, 
right? So common example where we do actually see all the way up to departmental charges on progressive discipline is officers losing stuff, right? Not taking care of property. So if you have a DCC for losing something, you have a lot of incentive to make sure you don't lose anything or break anything um, during that period of administrative use. Because once you end up with that written reprimand, now that's three years that you have to go without losing something. And if you don't, guess what? Your next bite of the apple is up a departmental charge and you're sitting before the chief having to explain to her why you lost your wallet in an Arby's, right? And contained your division ID. I'm not making that one up, yeah. Are you gonna talk a little bit more about what that DCC process looks like or what the written reprimand process looks like when you said it's a piece of paper with the box checked? Is that really all it is or like, you know, what, what goes into that? So that's gonna be uh, supervisor dependent, right? So it's generally the immediate supervisor who actually issues the discipline. And it's up to that supervisor to, you know, I think do that in a mindful way. Um, when I had subordinates and had to issue discipline, I tried to make it a very sort of deliberate and um, thoughtful discussion about what got us here and how we can avoid getting here in the future. Um, because you know we're all adults, and, and it's it's about willful modification of behavior, and this is sort of a reminder to do that. Um, but there is no sort of set process. You will discuss X, Y, and Z with the officer when you issue the discipline, things like that. Um, there's usually some uh, curiosity about our uses of force and how we discipline. Uh, violations of our use of force rule of conduct. So I broke that one down a little bit further. And so to your point, sir, uh, this, you can see that, yes, some of these violations of this directive resulted in only a DCC, but uh, a number of them resulted in deviation from progressive discipline all the way up to uh, suspensions and leave forfeitures. And this is, again, over the last six years. And for 2018, I. I think by the end of when it's all said and done, it'll probably look more like 2017. Any questions about this? The zero through nine, these are the number of um, actual DCCs or written reprimands according to the key at the bottom. So you've had two in 2018? Yes, sir. Okay. We've had two. Uh, where the discipline has been finally entered, right? So again, 2018, you know, the year hasn't closed out and the administrative process takes a while. So we might see a few more cases added to that by the end of the year. Um, it'll probably look something a little bit more like 2017 but when it's all closed out, but that's year to date, that's correct. We've had one DCC issued and one written reprimand issued for a violation of the force rule of conduct this year. This is just use of force. So we've seen since 2012 there are eight terminations, not including the resignation in lieu of terminations. None of those are represented since 2013 here. Have none of those been for use of force? For force? No. Interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We had uh, a recommendation, or excuse me, a decision by the safety director to terminate an officer for um, an out-of-policy use of force, and that was overturned by an arbitrator. The chief's recommendation on that was a 24-hour suspension without leave forfeiture. All right. Here's our discipline broken. Oh, okay. I did not have to take a PowerPoint test to get my job. So. <laughs> a little surprise there for you. All right. This is uh, discipline broken down by the officer's race. Again, this is from about 2012 to present. It's whatever is in our new discipline tracking system. Any questions on this one? Anyone else? Or, sir? No. All right. Uh, here it is broken down by officer sex. Uh, and for some reason, again, this is sort of the garbage in, garbage out of the database. There are a few where either sex or race was not listed. So for where race is known, 
um, this is uh, the information we have. So for your information, the racial demographics of the division, last numbers I could find, 87% white, 10% black, 1% Asian, 1% Hispanic, and 1% other. That's the one on the slide, the information you just shared? Uh, the, no, the that's, not, that's not on the slide. Could I get that one more time? Absolutely. So this is, I think I got this from the 2017 annual report, which again, you can find online. I think I have it. Didn't we get that? Yes. You did. You did. Okay. Yeah, I've got it. Never okay. mind. It, it's I'll find there. it. Yes, sir. So I have a quick question for you. For the discipline by uh, officer race, do you all house or keep somewhere where it is the different violations or discipline rule of conduct and break that down by race so we can see where the violations are taking place and then how the discipline is being administered? I am 95% sure that that exact thing is housed by our HR Bureau. I've seen it and I'm, I'm fairly certain it's broken down by rule of conduct, but I'm not 100%. And not, do they do the same for gender as well? I believe so, yes ma'am. Is that something to request through you, sir? Okay. Thank you. Right. So um, are we going to get that? Are we going to get that digitally, or are we going to get that in like a paper form? I got to see how big it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's talk briefly about arbitration because you're going to get a whole bunch more of this here in a little bit. Uh, this is solely disciplinary arbitrations, and this goes back, we have decent records back about the last 15 years for our disciplinary arbitrations. And so these are our results for the Division of Police. In about one third of the, of, uh, the cases that have gone to arbitration, uh, the arbitrator has denied the grievance, which is good for the employer. That means the employee is aggrieving their discipline, saying that you didn't have just cause, and the arbitrator says, nope, you're wrong, the employer had it right. So that is a what I would consider a full win, right? The grievance is denied. So that's the green slice there. In about another third of the cases, the grievance is sustained in part. And that means that the arbitrator somewhat agrees with what the grievance had to say. That might be a win, or it might mostly be a loss for us. It sort of depends. So if we wanted an officer terminated and the uh, arbitrator's award sustains it in part and brings him back with a lengthy suspension, I wouldn't think that's a win because we wanted to be rid of the officer and now we're forced to bring them back, right? Uh, and then in about another third of the cases, the grievance is completely sustained. Um, so Rich will probably talk about why that is. My take on it is there are certain structural issues that put the employer at a disadvantage. As I've already said, uh, we bear the burden in a discipline case of showing that just cause was met. Uh, you're talking to a you know, third party neutral, so you know, things that might be obvious to you are somewhat hard to convey to them. Um, and then also in terminations or cases where there's sort of stigmatizing allegations, the arbitrators actually demand a higher burden of proof. So they demand um, clear and convincing evidence. They don't want to fire somebody just on a you know preponderance of the evidence basis, which is how we sustain misconduct as it's you know going up the chain or coming out of internal affairs. So um, and, and then I guess the other thing is, you know, the FOP gets to pick what cases they take to arbitration, and they don't take every officer termination or every discipline case to arbitration. They get to pick and choose the cases that they feel the strongest about or that they think they have good arguments for. You know, the city, on the other hand, is obligated to defend everything, whether it's good facts or bad facts. Whether somebody, you know, at the sergeant level made a bad call that uh, trickles on up the chain and, and causes issues down the line, we still have to defend that action. So I think that's part of the structural disadvantage. But, you know, to be quite frank, Arbitrations are risky for both sides. You really don't know what you're going to get um, some of the time. 
Can you give us a sense of what kind of, um, I assume most of these are not like DCC or written movement, these are more serious types of uh, discipline? Right, so for discipline cases, it's usually lengthy suspensions or terminations that are being arbitrated. There have been a couple um, where uh, recently a written reprimand was arbitrated because um, we felt the officer's behavior was unbecoming of the officer, as opposed to sort of low-level, rude and discourteous behavior. We felt it was slightly more egregious than that. And so that officer was issued a written reprimand instead of a documented constructive counseling. And that one went to arbitration, and the city prevailed in that one. All right, so here are our trends in sort of sustained departmental charges. So this is at the discipline and grievance level. So this is at the executive level where the chief has decided, yes, departmentally charged this officer, and we've had a hearing, and now I'm sustaining that charge. I believe that it occurred, and, and we're going to sanction the officer. Uh, here are use of force and use of firearms separated out, and then on the next slide, I combine them. And if anyone has any questions as I'm going through these, uh, feel free to. Right. Uh oh. We have, uh, this is an interesting one, violation of rules and division directives. Uh, that's that one where if you recall from the overall chart, that's what we discipline officers for a lot at the low level. And we hardly see it at all when we're talking about departmental charges, suspensions, and terminations. Uh, my theory on that is that we used to uh, departmentally charge officers for violations of our pursuit directive, and that was, they were departmentally charged under this rule of conduct. Uh, we got hit in the mouth a couple times on arbitrations um, maybe eight years ago now, uh, and arbitrators sort of said, you can't really do that. And so we've stopped doing that, and I think that reflects a, a lot of the steep decrease in the number. Obedience to laws and ordinances. Again, the ones that rise to the level of departmental charges are usually off-duty OVIs. Um, they could also be um, disorderly conduct, things like that. Unbecoming conduct. Uh, we've seen an increase in those in the last couple of years, and I attribute that to Chief Jacobs' sort of emphasis on officers projecting the correct image to the public and holding ourselves to a higher standard. Because again, you're stuck with us. And then the final one, uh, this is the one we hate to see, uh, untruthfulness. So there are very, you know, most of this, I can give you the lawyer answer if it depends on what we do with this stuff. And it really does on a case-by-case -case basis depend on the facts as to how high or low the sanction is. If there is a sustained finding of untruthfulness, the recommendation from the chief of police will be termination. Full stop. Questions? Questions about anything? Oh, thanks, so. So we talked throughout this about some of the other charges. What are the cause for the eight terminations then, if none of them were use of force? Uh, so a couple of them were um, what I like to call time banditry, so people not, uh, you know, leaving work and not accounting for their time, things like that. Um, we had uh, one officer who uh, admitted to using marijuana over a long period of time um, outside of the, you know, drug test situation where there would be a contractual protection as to the level of discipline that could be issued. Um, one officer was recently terminated for uh, soliciting prostitutes while on duty, which is also frowned upon. Um, off the top of my head, I think that's... And untruthfulness. You're right. Untruthfulness is, is the other one. That's, that's the most consistent. Um, if you sort of run our... You know, every time we get one of these discipline cases, we look at what have we done in the past, right? What's the range of discipline that this officer can expect? Because we want to keep them in that range, because you have to treat people equitably. That's one of the principles of just cause. Now, there can be aggravating circumstances, and there can be mitigating circumstances, but we want to establish that range. 
with untruthfulness, there really is no range. If there is a sustained finding of untruthfulness, that's going to result in a recommendation of termination from the chief of police every time. And that's because our integrity is, you know, above everything else. And we cannot have officers who don't display that. Sir. Of those untruthfulness, have you seen those increase as body cams have been used? Or is it um, too early to tell? I think it's too early to tell. We're just now starting to see body camera cases. Um, and I haven't seen one yet that involves uh, an untru a potential untruthfulness charge. In Columbus. Right, in Columbus. Thank you. Same thing, how, how the body camera footage has changed the process from your perspective. So we're just now starting to see those cases within the last year or so. Um, it is providing us, I would say, with uh, much more to mull over. Um, and it is it's a, and another perspective to consider, for sure. Last time, it seems to be more exonerating than incriminating with respect to allegations against officers. I can also tell you in my talks with the Franklin County Prosecutor's Office, with respect to criminal cases, they love it. <clears throat> so to go back to your discipline by officer uh, race from 12 to present, it seems like there's an increase. It seems like it goes to 19 percent or uh, for leave forfeiture and suspension for um, African American um, officers by percentage when they're about 10% of the uh, total force. It, but it seems to be consistent along DCC mm -hmm. written reprimand, but then it doubles right there at a leave uh, suspension and uh, forfeiture or leave forfeiture and suspension. So has that been examined why that um, exists? So I, I found that interesting as well, and I did examine that when I was putting this together. Um, you know, someone smarter than me can, you know, probably run a chi-squared analysis to figure out how, you know, statistically significant it is, because I, I frankly don't know. Um, but what I did do is I looked at what those 18 cases were to see, hey, is this, is this stuff that we would expect a suspension or leave forfeiture for, for any officer? And what I found is that of those 18, six are progressive discipline cases. So those are virtually automatic, right? That's the officer who keeps losing stuff within the timelines for administrative use. You do that enough times, eventually you're going to have to go sit before the chief of police and explain yourself. Uh, so six of those cases were those sort of progressive discipline cases. Um, there were three sort of repeat contestants on this game show that we have. Uh, and so they, I think, skewed things a little bit. Um, they were before the chief for different uh, misconduct, but within the same period, all, serve suspensions. Um, and then the others, uh, one was a shooting that was ruled to be outside of policy. Uh, one was an officer who had a negligent discharge of his firearm in the presence of many bystanders while he was struggling with a suspect. Um, one was an officer who admitted to smoking marijuana off duty. One was a pursuit violation back in 2009 when we were still departmentally charging people for those. And one was uh, unlawful force after an unlawful arrest. So when I looked at those, those are all things that I would expect suspensions and leave forfeitures for, for any officer who committed those acts. So the progressive discipline process can take from 2009 all the way to 2012? Why would that number a, a chase from 2009, make it on to the 12 to present number. So when I say that those cases are progressive, what I mean is that when they finally had departmental charges and either served a suspension or you know gave up leave, it was because they went through that progressive discipline. So that still has to meet the contractual timelines, but um, I'm only looking at the end result of that one case. So okay, this officer. Um, had 16 hours of leave forfeiture because he lost his identification, right? Lo yeah, losing your identification is not going to get you a 16-hour leave forfeiture if it's your first offense, right? But this officer had lost his radio a, a year or so prior, and then 
before that had you know lost something else. Uh, so he just worked his way up the ladder. Thank you, Lieutenant. Um, we're going to take a 15 minute break and Director Speaks, um, our uh, community member has a very specific question. Well, I'm certainly very specific, but it's really around numbers. And I would ask for you to chat with her and to see if there is someone who can provide answers to her concerns. My concern, I didn't want a particular presenter to be put on the spot if it wasn't his or her area, but I think that the question is, is germane and legitimate, and you can maybe help us figure out who can get us the answers. Glad to do okay. so. Thank you. We are on uh, the break. It, I, can, I can tell the energy level. <laughs> you know, I'm the one who got up, drove to Cincinnati, and came back, but I, I, it's not just me. I see the energy level sort of going uh, down. But we saved the best for last. Well, you know, um, I don't believe I know Richard. And Richard, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name. Would you please do a self-introduction for us? Absolutely, Madam Chair, and thank you. I do appreciate the ability to come and address the commission. Uh, my name is Rich Coglanese. I am a senior attorney in uh, City Attorney Zach Klein's office in the labor section. Uh, I've been in that office since all of January, so I don't have a lot of background with, um, with or, or history with labor and arbitration as it relates to the Columbus Police Department specifically. But with that said, I've been practicing for 22 years before I started with the city attorney's office. I had been in the attorney general's office for that whole period of time. Uh, about half of that time, I did um, labor and employment. About half of that time, I did, believe it or not, elections litigation. I know they have nothing in common except for the letter E, and so I have said I am actually a Sesame Street lawyer. I special, uh, my practice is brought to you by the letter E. Um, during the last four years uh, that I was at the AG's office, from 2014 until 2018, I was actually the assistant chief of the employment section. So, as I say, I don't I don't have a de an in-depth historical understanding of CPD and the FOP contract, but you know, for for what what I lack in that, I think I do make up a little bit in at least some pretty in-depth experience in in the labor and employment field. Um, so I look forward to talking to everybody about uh, arbitration specifically, and I know that uh, we had kind of talked a little bit during Jen's presentation, and I took some notes. I believe I have three questions that were pending that I said I'd address in my presentation, the first of which was a pu public record and cell phone type question. I'm going to go ahead and get that out of the way now. Public records are those things which document the function of the office. So if it is somehow or other written down and it documents the function of the office, there's a great chance that it would qualify under Ohio law as a public record. So for purposes of like a cell phone, what does that mean? Well, if I text my boss and say, hey, I'm running, you know, I'm running late. I'll meet you for lunch at 1245. Does that document the function of the office? No. If I text my boss and say, hey, just talk to three witnesses about this. We need to talk. Well, outside of the fact that that's attorney-client privilege, so this is probably a terrible example for you. Uh, would that be considered a public record? Yeah, probably. If we're dealing with police officers who may be, t may be texting back and forth about something that happened on shift or something they saw, is that a public record? Again, can't, can't give absolute answers, but chances are probably yes. So the advice we always give people, I'll get you, is don't use your personal devices for work-related information generally because it may be considered a public record. Yes, sir. 
So does texting something like I'm going to be a few minutes late for work to my boss from my personal cell phone open the door to for consideration that other work activities may have taken place on that phone? Possibly. And so if there was a public records request made for the correspondence between me and Pam about and, and you know, public records law is probably a, a two-day presentation if we did it right. But a, a, if there's a proper public records request for that type of a communication, my employer and I both have an obligation to take a look at my cell phone and figure out what's responsive to the request and then turn it over. So it's dangerous to do an awful lot of work over your personal devices. Right, I was just wondering what kind of precipitates that, what kind of causes that to be, request to be made. You know, any, anybody can make public records requests for just about anything. Mm -hmm. And so just because something is a public record, you know, I mean, it only turns out where, where I may have to check my cell phone and actually turn it over when it gets to the point of, you know, um, Director Speaks made a, made a public records request for something that happens to just be on my phone. But you're not going to, as the employer, as the employee, you're not going to be spending all day worrying about where is that particular document for purposes of the public records law. Does that answer your question? Kind of, but I won't belabor it. Okay. Um, the other two issues, and I'll deal with these during the presentation, one of which was the right of self-incrimination and you know administrative investigations and like cell phones and things. We'll get into that once we get to it's called Garrity, and there's a United States Supreme Court case on that issue. The other one was what happens if the chief of police makes one recommendation and the director of public safety goes a different way, and we can talk about that as we kind of get into the arbitration stuff. So. Why is discipline part of the collective bargaining agreement? Well, it's real simple. Ohio law mandates it to be. Uh, Ohio has a collective bargaining law, 4117, that mandates that you go ahead and um, bargain over terms and conditions of employment. And because discipline is considered a term and condition of employment, it's got to be in the collective bargaining agreement. You guys have, have heard about this all day. I don't mean to, to belabor it, but under the city's collective bargaining agreement, you can't discipline without just cause. And again, also we've heard of critical nature that is part of the collective bargaining agreement, what the chief can do, and uh, how it has to be done. But the biggest thing to take away, and you've heard it said several times, is progressive discipline. So again, I don't mean to belabor, but what is progressive discipline? Progressive discipline is a process that we follow to make sure that we correct behavior. So really when we are dealing with a disciplinary system, the end goal really truly is what can we do to fix what is viewed as a problem? And most of the stuff we see really is not of, and I don't mean to downplay it, but not of tremendous import. So that although for purposes, no doubt, for CPD and for proper respect, for proper discipline, the manner in which a police officer is wearing a hat is important, but is it earth shattering for the rest of us? You know, does it does it matter if we just call that person in and say, "Hey, you know, you're doing it wrong. This is th these are what the rules are." But part of that too is the discipline of the force and making sure that if somebody isn't listening to what their supervisor is saying, there's a way to go through the process. So you start with those DCs, generally start with those DCCs, move to writtens, move to suspensions, and if necessary, ultimately move to termination. So when we're talking about discipline, 
there are kind of four pillars that I want to talk to you guys about. The first is the Constitution. The second is the city charter. The third is the collective bargaining agreement. And then the fourth is case law. So constitutional issues and discipline. There are really three issues here that we've got to take a look at. The first one is Loudermill. The second one is due process. And the third one is Garrity. So what do we mean by that? OK, Loudermill was a United States Supreme Court case that said that public employees have due process rights. They should be told what they did wrong and have an opportunity to respond. So, you know, it's, it really is the, the, that Garfield uh, cartoon at the bottom. You ate my food, you ate Odie's food, you ate your food. What do you have to say for yourself? And the response is dessert, dessert, dessert. So, you know, you do give the, the employee an opportunity to, to respond because, quite frankly, sometimes when you're going to an employee and say you did this, the employer may be wrong or the employee may have a good excuse. So let's find out what that is. Due process. This is where it gets, again, and as, as, um, as, as Tim mentioned earlier, this is the floor, okay? This is absolutely under the Constitution. We can't do any less than this. So for due process, first thing we ought to think about is, is there a property right? And then what do we do with it? So yeah, you heard as government employees, most government employees have a property right in their job. What does that mean? Well, for everybody in the division of police, they have a, once they are hired and get through probation, they have a right to that job. And we can only take it away for certain reasons. And then we start talking about deprivation, okay? Pre-deprivation and post-deprivation. Pre-deprivation means before we do something to them. And that's the, basically, what do you have to say for yourself? If we do that and we let them respond, we've met pre-deprivation process. The Supreme Court has said, especially like in the employment context, because these decisions get done somewhat quickly, we got to give the employee the right to go ahead and challenge once something happens to them. So if they've been terminated, if they've been suspended, what kind of post-deprivation process do we have? And so through the collective bargaining agreement, we've set up the arbitration process. So that takes care of their property right post-deprivation. So for purposes of pre-deprivation rights, you'll notice that the collective bargaining agreement, and as you've heard, is a little bit more, um, shall we say, extensive than what the Constitution requires. So we get into not just notice, but we get into representation. They can, the, the FOP member can bring a union steward into the, uh, or the, a, a uh, lawyer from the lodge into the process. Disclosure, there are, there are specific things in the collective bargaining agreement that detail what we have to tell a member during the in investigative process. Uh, they have a right to access certain records. They have a right to have the chief recommend certain discipline. And then there can be a departmental hearing in front of the director of public safety. So again, for purposes of investigation and notice, the collective bargaining agreement spells out who can actually do the investigation. And it'll be somebody in the chain of command, the EEO uh, office, IAB, or the office of the public safety director. So those are the those are under the contract the the various entities that can actually investigate. And again, yes, sir. Are there certain types of misconduct allegations are investigated by certain certain offices on that list? Or so. 
so um, CPD is probably better set to answer this. Um, my understanding is that depending on the type of charge, it'll be generally IAB, but it may be departmental if it's certain other things. I don't know how far off I am on that, but if... The answer is yes, sometimes. So for example, we will talk about this at an upcoming with respect to use of force in the chain of command review as opposed to internal affairs and what Commander Boddicker is an example. Thanks. Another thing we're, I'll, I'll oh. Another thing we're currently looking at is uh, EEOC type of investigations done um, uh, by a specialist. And so we'll pass it up to the public safety director investigate directly. I wouldn't say we quote investigate. It's more uh, the adjudication of the case once once it comes to us. H having said that, um, we have had not more so in police but in fire. Uh, we have brought in some outside folks on a couple of EEOC type things in the in the past, similar to what we're looking at doing now uh, for both divisions on the EEOC side. Yes, sir. So this kind of goes back to the earlier presentation um, about the, our, the findings of the fact finding. How is the city able to circum, if the constitution is the overarching document, how is the city able to circumvent the uh, person who's being accused's ability to interview the witness, like an accuser, okay. or have their party uh, interview the Right? So I'm not going to pretend to be a lawyer, but they, you have to get the information, the facts that are against you. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so the louder mill stuff, that notice and opportunity, the Constitution, that's the floor. We can't mm -hmm. go below that. So we can't just one day go up to somebody and just say, you're fired. Mm -hmm. Right? We got to tell them, under the Constitution, we've got to tell them, hey, you've been late for work. What do you have to say about it? Mm -hmm. What we've done is built on that floor. So, you know, it, it, it's the foundation of the house. We've built the collective bargaining agreement <clears throat> that provides all of these other processes where they have a right to witnesses, they have a right to files, they have a right to all of those other things. So that's how that works. It's not going below what the Constitution requires it's actually adding additional protections to what the Constitution says is the bare minimum. Absolutely, and so I wasn't saying that necessarily. Okay. I was saying that if the FOP asked to have access to the witnesses, uh, if there were, uh, if there was a use of force allegation, that they have the ability to also interview those individuals as it's going into the discipline process. How are you not able, how does the city not able to give them that if the Constitution is the guiding document. Because that not that a, a right that you have under the Constitution in due process? I think, I think you're thinking about criminal charges versus... Right. Right, right, right. right. But this isn't a criminal... Okay. We're not dealing with the criminal investigation. So if, if there's criminal conduct that's being investigated, then, then the officer has to answer ultimately to the grand jury and to the criminal process. What we're talking about is, yeah, if we're just going to go to discipline Internal somebody. discipline. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. But having said that, um, if someone is accused of something, generally it's, it's a formal proceeding. You, you're given, um, you're served mm -hmm. with the allegations and what violation, what rule you violated. So you have that notice there. There's then this louder mill type hearing you're going to hear the evidence against you. You may or may, you were probably represented by the FOP, and you have a right to, to question, uh, to ask questions. So, so there is that due process right, close play. It's, it's, That's it's, why I was... it's a very close approximation to the. Uh, uh, part of yeah. this too is if one of those witnesses happens to be John Q. Public, right? You know, there's no way to force John Q. Public to come into a director's hearing and to testify against that officer. The FOP can't force John Q. Public to talk to them. The director can't force John Q. Public to talk to him. Now, if it also happens to be a criminal issue, the grand jury can force John Q. Public to come in and testify. 
But if what it is is somebody saw a police officer do something that may also be criminal, for purposes of the disciplinary track, nobody can force the public to talk. Now, we can force our employees to talk, even if it's a criminal issue. And this is kind of where it gets into, we were talking about earlier, about the cell phone. And if that cell phone has got incriminating information on it that may be used in a criminal context, what happens? And I believe, actually, it may even be the next upcoming slide. Garrity. So this was the United States Supreme Court case, recognizing the problem that as the government, we are an employer and we're also a prosecutor. And you know, you guys all know the TV series, right? What's the first thing that cops always say when they arrest somebody? You got the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. But as an employer, we have a right to question our employees. So how do you balance those two? So what the Supreme Court said is, OK, if you as the employer decide to question your employee, you can force your employee to answer questions because you can order them to. And if they don't, it's insubordination, and you can fire them. What do we do if you do that and they tell you things that may, in fact, be criminal? Well, if you forced your employee to answer questions under threat of discipline, government cannot use that information in any criminal prosecution. So you as an employer kind of in those situations have got a choice, right? What do you want to do? You bring your employee in and you say, and quite frankly, everybody's got forms to this effect. You sign the form, it's called a Garrity warning. You know, I'm telling you, you got to answer the question. If you don't answer the question, you're going to be disciplined for insubordination. What'd you do? Okay. So now, whatever that person says in response to that, or if, you know, we're going through their, their cell phone and we find information, that stuff can't be used in the criminal prosecution. We may just decide, and, and again, these things end up getting so fact specific, but during the investigation, the employer may decide, you know what, I'm gonna sit back, I'm gonna let the criminal process work itself out, and then engage, you know, then bring some of the rest of this stuff in. It becomes incredibly fact specific, but kind of as big picture stuff that's the division we're talking about. So is everybody comfortable with, with that and kind of how that works? I remember Garrity for a couple meetings in the, uh, I don't know when we're going to hit it, Janu late January, February, when we start talking about the review of use of force investigations. So tuck that in the back of your mind. Because that was exactly where I was going is whether or not the possibility exists of compromising whether or not both discipline can take place and um, you know legal proceedings can move forward based on this process. So that, uh, maybe I should just wait until after the early slide. So <laughs> concurrent, <laughs> concurrent yeah. investigation, right? And then yeah. whether that's compromised, you know, down the road, one can share one way, but not the other way. Yeah. Information. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's exactly an excellent point, too. Um, the other thing is once you've got criminal investigations going, obviously that is separate and completely independent from the disciplinary investigation, and the criminal investigators are not going to be telling the civil workforce investigators, hey, this is everything we're thinking about, and this is who we're talking to, and this is what we got so far. What do you think? They hold that stuff quiet. Yes, sir. Um, question, I don't know if you can answer, but... It seems like given, given this, that there might be some strategic you know, dynamic where you wait for the criminal stuff to happen first, and then if the officer's not guilty, then you proceed with the disciplinary, where the, then the timing restrictions in the contract become potentially really important, right, about how long you wait and all that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And depending on what the charges are, sometimes it is the best in, in the best interests of the employer to go ahead and, hey, let's let, the, let's let 
the court system work its way out. And let's see what happens, you know, did the officer get indicted? Did the employee get indicted? Uh, have they pled or they, have they been convicted? And go from that. Old if it's a criminal. So, oh, in, okay. so in, in the future, re remember this too, that for a, a significant use of force, you can have an internal use of force investigation. You can have a criminal case, and then subsequently you could have a 1983 or civil case action, all reviewing that, whatever happened on that date. And just to kind of give a real life example to that, this is not CPD, this was in my prior employer, this was State Highway Patrol. Uh, they had a lieutenant who was in charge of the Marietta uh, patrol post. Um, he was having a relationship with, one of his, with the wife of one of his subordinates. He decided at one point it was a good idea to put a GPS unit on her car. Uh, he, uh, what else did he do? Ultimately, they ended up finding out that he had stolen three guns. He had filed destruction paperwork and claimed to have destroyed the guns. Well, when the county sheriff uh, served search warrants both for his house and the patrol field office, they found out that he had guns in his locker. So he was ultimately charged and convicted uh, for all of that. Um, in the meantime, the disciplinary process moved forward. Um, the way they are set up, it's a little bit different. Because of the level that he was at in the patrol, it wasn't an arbitration. It was a hearing through what's called the State Employment Relations Board, which is kind of similar to doing a civil service hearing. That whole thing was stayed, and I just found out that based on the criminal convictions, they finally just done away with the discipline. He's been terminated and his appeal on his disciplinary charges was, was done away with. So that's kind of a real life example about what happens with all of this stuff. So notice under the collective bargaining agreement, once an investigation that might result in discipline begins, member has to be notified about it immediately. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal Tim's line and say it depends. Um, you can't say, you know, pass it to the lawyer, so. <laughs> you know, immediately generally is along the lines of as soon as practicable. So, you know, if, do, you have to, do you have to give them notice within five minutes? No. I, I don't think anybody's going to ever contend that. Depending on the circumstance, probably, I, and, and you guys know the way you operate, I would assume probably within 24 hours. Is that fair? Next tour of duty. Next tour of duty. Okay. Okay, so then, yeah, apparently within, within the person's next, next assigned work day. Thanks. So again, as we talked about the contract vote versus louder mill, you can see you can really see the difference with what's required. So what happens to the employee pending? Generally speaking, they can they will continue in the position, but the chief does have the authority to reassign pending outcome. So again, it depends on what the charges are, uh, whether or not. The chief will do that, but she does have the authority to do that if need be. So again, as I said, Constitution, so we've covered that. City Charter. City Charter specifies that if the chief suspends, demotes, or terminates, the employee has a right to a hearing in front of the, the Director of Public Safety. So that's where we go from the hearing in front of the chief with her recommendation to the hearing in front of the public, uh, in front of public safety director. So again, once we get there, members entitled to representation. Safety director has the ultimate authority to decide um, whether charges are sustained and what level of discipline should be meted out, and not bound by the recommendation from the chief. So this kind of gets into the question, 
What happens when the chief says 24 hours and the director says termination? I'm going to give you a lawyer answer. Depends. Um, you know, in my experience, what, what I have found is different, different people when doing the dis, a disciplinary process have different views. And they have different issues that they may, kind of, in the way that they go about determining what's right and what's wrong. So without really kind of getting into a specific case by case, somebody may view things either, either stronger or, or, or less strong than others. There may be situations that, you know, doing comparisons are bad or good. Um, ultimately, what happens is, you know, what the public safety director determines the level of discipline that's the level of discipline, and it becomes my job and my cohort's job to defend that, because that's the ultimate decision. And the same case, and I just don't remember this, when the chief imposed a 24-hour suspension, did the officer appeal that to the director? I believe it goes up automatically because it was a suspension. It went up automatically? Okay. So. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And, and in that case, if I remember, the arbitrator said, ultimately didn't side with the safety director because they said his background was in fire versus, versus police. Sorry, so, what are you saying, Glenn? In, in that case, when the arbitrator's report that overruled the director's decision said, you know, we, that, that one of the one of the bases for, for the arbitrator's findings was that the public safety director had a background in fire rather than police, and therefore his judgment is that I, where I guess is that a just cause type consideration? It, that? it is part of that whole thing. I'm sorry, was it actually in the arbitrator's report? I think. Well, and actually, one thing I heard was is that yes, it was an unlawful use of force, mm -hmm. right? right which I thought was really a good thing. Yes. But was the punishment right, appropriate? Right, right. And, and that is, that really, once we start talking about just cause, that really truly is the question. Because it's very rare that we get into a situation where do, we're doing an arbitration and it's going to come back as those things didn't happen, right? I mean, we're not going to have gone through all of these processes with all of these investigations and all of these hearings and have somebody say, yeah, everything that you said this guy did or this, this lady did never happened. It truly is, does the, in a sense, does the punishment fit the crime? And quite honestly, no matter what and uh, who you are, once you're sitting in an arbitration, that arbitrator has got life experiences and has been hearing cases, not just from CPD, but you know from all over Ohio or in some situations all over multiple states that they may have been looking at things for 25 or 30 years and putting it in perspective, regardless of the fact that they're really only supposed to look at, at what we're doing here, but they may be putting it into other perspectives and start saying either conduct is, is worse or better or, well, that's just way too severe. Because for good or for bad, sometimes when arbitrators look at this, what they're going to say is you're taking this person's livelihood away. And when you've terminated them, they're done with your department, and if you're terminating them for use of force, they may not get a job at any other department. So can I, as an arbitrator, feel comfortable making the decision in affirming that termination that this person may not be able to work in their chosen profession again? And we can debate whether or not that's good or bad, and we can debate whether or not that's fair or unfair to the employer, to members of this community. But that's the system we operate in, and we can't change that. So when they're viewing it that way, 
we can do our best as lawyers to the director of the Department of Public Safety in pointing out why we think it's an incredibly severe action and why we think the punishment does in fact fit the crime, but sometimes they just disagree with us. Yes, sir. Good, I'm glad you used that last, because I disagree that we can't change it, and that's not meant to be a personal attack. I think that kind of goes to why we're here. But who are the arbitrators, and are they appointed, are they elected? How do we determine who these individuals are? Because I know they bring a certain set of life experiences to their decision-making that could color their decision-making. Sure. So it's a slide that's coming up. Do you mind if I just defer you for a few slides? because you got all the answers ahead. <laughs> so again, as we're kind of talking about, just doubling back, as we're talking about the director's hearing, other things that folks are entitled to, written statement of all the charges um, with the specifications. So it's, you know, you violated rule 1.06. Specifically, you did, on this date, at this time, you did that. Um, they're entitled to question witnesses. They're entitled to cross to call witnesses. Uh, it's recorded by the city, so you know we we go into the director's conference room, and he sits there. The lieutenant's there presenting the case. The FOP is there saying, you know, either nothing should happen or it's it's not as serious. There's a court reporter there taking it all down, and you know in several of these circumstances, me or one of my cohorts is in the room as well. Um, director then makes a final decision based on what he has heard. And that gets us to the arbitration and under the collective bargaining agreement, um, they do have a right to, to appeal these. So, selection of the arbitrator. Under the collective bargaining agreement, it's a panel of six. So we have six people who serve as arbitrators. They do a random draw. So FOP files, an, files a grievance. We start out beginning of the collective bargaining agreement, six names. So the way we get the names is they get sent to us. Um, arbitrators, I'm sorry? Who sends the names? I believe it's the American Association of Arbitration. Is it AAA? They covered it a couple. Of yeah. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. They covered it. I'm sorry. What was that? It, this was covered when your your partner was here two weeks ago or whatever. So uh, it depends. So fact finding has one list of names, and that comes through the State Employment Relations Board. But this, for arbitration under the collective bargaining agreement, I believe you get your names from FMCS. The Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service. That's um, right. And yeah. those are all the members. They're just arbitrators who have been approved by that service. And those arbitrators, we just get a list of random names there, although we are able to make some specifications about specifically geography, where they're coming from. Yeah, actually, it's the American Arbitration Association. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 12 6. <laughs> so we get those names from the American Arbitration Association. And this is in the collective bargaining agreement. Um, it is section 12.6. Um, and so as we are replacing people on the arbitration panel, either side can strike folks. So the FOP can say, you know, hey, um, I don't like this arbitrator. He or she is gone. So when they do that, get another list of names. We continue, you know, we do that until we get seven names. So whoever, you know, who it, it sometimes is whoever is left standing, and those are the folks that are left on the on the arbitration list. But as we're dealing with it, you know, we get the list of six. We go through them one at a time. Once everybody's heard a case, we can start striking them as it comes up again, so we don't have to go through the rotation again. Um, the striking happens once everybody is heard. So that's where, that's where we get them from. These are folks who do hear a lot of labor arbitrations. I mean, you know, you're not, we're not dealing with folks who do 
um, consumer transactions arbitrations or other things. I mean, there's a lot of cases that go to arbitration. We really are dealing with folks who specialize in this area of law. So that's where they have to be drawn from. It's a term of the collective bargaining agreement. So that's, that's the, as I say, that is kind of where we are working from and who we can draw from. Authority of the arbitrator. So one of the biggest things is that there's, the arbitrator is supposed to conduct a fair and impartial hearing, right? They're not called neutrals for, for nothing. They are supposed to hear what happened and reach their best judgment. They have to apply generally accepted arbitration rules. Well, what's that mean? Well, you know, generally it's not, it's, if you go down to the courthouse and you watch a trial, that's not an arbitration, okay? It's nowhere near that formal. Is it, you know, hey, officer so-and-so, what did you do? No, it's a lot more formal than that. We do call witnesses. We have people sworn in. They do take testimony. Arbitrators do take their job seriously. I mean, they, they, do, they do give both sides the opportunity to present whatever they think is relevant to the case and justifies the decision from our end, justifies the decision that the employer made. And as you've heard today, it's our burden to prove. And so that means not only that the officer or, or the employee did whatever we claim they did, but also that the punishment fits the crime. And then, and this is the toughest part, the decision of the arbitrator is final and binding. And, you know, I know, I know we, we hear this every now and then. Well, the arbitrator just screwed that up. Why can't, why can't we appeal it? Well, that's not the way collective bargaining works, um, either on a state or a federal level. So the whole purpose of collective bargaining and arbitration really is that everybody got together and reached a conclusion that said, hey, we're going to take these disagreements and we're going to go over here, and we're going to present our disagreement to this person, and they're going to tell us what happened. You know, who's right? Should the officer be terminated? Should the, the person get a weak suspension? Great. So because we've built the entire process around agreeing that this person over here has ultimate decision-making authority in, in figuring all of this stuff out, Courts are, are absolutely loath to try and step into that. Their theory is everybody reached a, an agreement. We're not, we, we're not and we can't interfere with that. So, you know, if it was a bad decision, whichever way it may, it's made, either it's a bad decision because a termination got overturned, or from the FOP's perspective, it's a bad decision because they didn't think that termination was justified in that situation. They thought that it should have been a lesser penalty. Neither side can really run to court and say, arbitrator screwed up. Yes, sir. So the city you want pays the cost of the arbitration? That, the cost gets split. Yeah. So um, arbitrator sends his, his or her bill in at the end of the arbitration, sends half of it to FOP, Half of it to us, I send it to public safety, who sends it off to be paid. And how much does that by arbitration? Yeah. I think it depends by arbitrator, but I think they usually charge around 900 a day. Does that sound right, George? Yeah. It is an arbitrator. The more experience, the better, the higher. But remember, I always think of this finality, mm -hmm. and it is far cheaper mm -hmm. and far quicker than a court case. So again, just cause, we've beaten that one. I mean, if folks want to get more specific about it, I'm happy to. Those are the same seven factors that you, that you heard. Yes, sir. So I'm interested in what Lieutenant Meyer said earlier, though. He said that something is in his, absent, in his words, absent from this list. And, and you said um, community concerns. And, I, and I'm interested in why you said that. 
how is that how does that factor in? So my point there was that you know the leaders that are making decisions for the division of police have to think about more than just these seven factors, right? They have to take into account community expectations. They have to take into account credibility within the division of police, maintain the legitimacy both inside and outside the division. In short, being a leader in the division of police is very hard. Um, but when it goes to the arbitration stage, all of those outside concerns, as valid as they might be, are not what our disciplinary decisions are tested on. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it does. It makes a lot of sense. That was crystal clear. But it goes back to another question then that from the viewpoint of the community, uh, to Lieutenant Meyer's uh, point, the actions of an officer can have can be far more damaging than just a job. Absolutely. Because of a whole lot of historical things, and we could go on and on down that road. Absolutely. But I think you go, you get what I mean. Oh, sir, I, I not only get what you mean, I agree with you. And what I will do with, with those types of things is if the, if the director says, I believe termination in this case is justified, because the action was so severe that this is where I, where I want to go. And one of the reasons that I want to go there is because the impact that, that this behavior has is negative to the community. I'm going to bring those arguments into the arbitration. Why? Because when we're talking about does the punishment fit the crime, the union's going to try and keep that, that inquiry as narrow as possible, right? Here's, here's what this person did. And hey, let's compare it to these three cases. And we see that these three cases, it was a lengthy suspension. And here it's a termination. So the punishment doesn't fit the crime, OK? That's their job. That's their argument. My job is to bring other things in and through testimony talk about how when we are dealing with, with this situation, this action is much more egregious than A, B, and C because of the, in part, the impact that it has on the community. Now, I'm gonna be successful in that all the time. I'm not, I'm not that good, no. Arbitrators aren't always gonna go there, but sometimes they do. And so, again, that's why we go there. It's no different than any other type of an employment case where, you know, I'm defending the city, saying this person should be fired, and here's why. And the plaintiff's lawyer is saying the person shouldn't be fired, or you never fired anybody else for that action. So it really becomes, in a sense, an incredible amount of minutia because we may not only be looking at this case, we may be looking at five or six other cases and trying to argue whether or not which one's worse. So in, in a sense, you're right. Community is nowhere on that because under the traditional view of just cause, the impact on the community doesn't matter. And I mean, let's think about that broadly, right? Labor law is a huge, huge area. We not only have public sector, we got private sector. So that if somebody who's working at a UAW plant is late to work, does that really affect you or I? Absolutely not. So these tests were really brought to the forefront in traditional private sector labor law. We're dealing with the public sector, so it's always a little bit different. And then on top of that, we're dealing with the division of police, which is even more different. But I'm not doing my job if the director says termination, if I don't try to bring those things in. I may not be successful, but the arbitrator is going to hear it. He or she may agree with me, he or she may disagree with me, but they're going to hear it. So that's, that's the way the process is put together. 
And you know, it really do then gets into that last question up there. Was the level of discipline reasonable and proportionate to the offense? So we're going to do our best to draw that as broadly as possible and point out those secondary harms. And here's where I think we get into some other issues. Uh, arbitrators obviously can modify, which means director says termination, union says no discipline, arbitrator comes back, 120, uh, you know, 120 hours of leave suspension or, or a, a, a time served suspension. Okay, nobody feels good after getting that. But that's really kind of where they are looking. And they have an absolute right to modify what the director has done. What's the, the Franklin County Sheriff case there? Oh, so that was actually just, I, this is kind of talking about, I, we were talking about the four pillars. This is the case law pillar. So through case law, that's just one of the cases that I found that just stands for the proposition that the, um, that the arbitrator has a right under the collective bargaining agreements to modify. So it's, it's just, I kind of threw that in there as a reminder to myself. <laughs> sure. One of the other things to remember, and it's important as you're thinking about how, how arbitrators view cases. Ultimately, the way they look at it is the goal of discipline is to correct behavior, not to punish. So sometimes that makes for difficult situations where, you know, the director has decided that, that this person should be terminated and the arbitrator thinks it's too severe. That generally is where, where the arbitrator is coming from. They think that, that basically the employee is still redeemable. And so that's where we, we see most of that situation arise. The other thing that we start talking about is mitigating factors. And so the arbitrator may apply those to determine that the punishment is too severe. And as I said, they can always fashion a different remedy than what anybody has decided should be done. Past practice comes into play, too. And again, we've talked about it, but what have you done in the past to people who did this? And you know, it just becomes our job to show that this is worse behavior than things that have occurred in the past. Now, I told you you can't go to court. That's not 100% right. It's like 99.9% .9 right. Um, there are limited situations where a court can review what an arbitrator did. And this is what the Ohio Revised Code says, basically. Um, because public policy really likes the finality that arbitration gives, generally can't go to court unless you can show, and these are the four things. Procu the award, so the arbitrator's decision was procured by corruption, fraud, or undue means. There was partiality or corruption. There was misconduct or refusal to hear appropriate evidence. And the arbitrator exceeded his or her powers or so imperfectly executed them that there was no real final decision. I will tell you that it is nearly impossible to prove that. And that fourth factor doesn't mean we think the arbitrator got it wrong. In fact, that fourth factor doesn't mean that the arbitrator, who is a lawyer, was wrong about the law. You know what? Arbitrator making an incorrect legal determination about what folks' legal responsibilities are, generally speaking, is not a sufficient ground for a court to overturn an arbitration award. The courts view it as, Everybody decided that this person was gonna, gonna decide your issue? Well, that's what you get for going to that person. And it's unfair sometimes, but that's the way they look at it. So what does the court examine when you get there? Does the award, does the decision draw its essence from the contract? Does it conflict with the contract? 
Can it be rationally derived from the contract? So as long as you can look and say, and, and here's basically the way a court's going to do it. Okay, we think that this person should have been fired, arbitrator said, no termination. Well, your contract says just cause. Can, can um, discipline somebody for just cause. You know what? The award draws its essence from the contract because it goes back to just cause and whether or not you met your burden. There is one other exception just to briefly touch on public policy. So you can vacate a decision if it violates well-defined public policy. What's that mean? Well, not much. Um, here are some cases that I came with. You can see the scale is nicely tilted because we got one that says yes and a whole bunch that say no. So a police officer falsified a traffic ticket. Court actually overturned the arbitration award uh, doing away with that officer's termination because it said there is a clearly defined public policy and law about lying on traffic tickets. So you can't actually sign a ticket knowing that the information that you're giving on the ticket is incorrect. But what did they say no to? Police officers lying in an investigation. Police officer lying to a supervisor about another officer's absence. A safety sensitive position failing a drug test. So that tells you, quite frankly, how hard that is to, to get a court to tell you whatever the arbitrator decided should be done away with. So um, I think if anybody has any questions. Any additional questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Matthew, you were going to make an announcement of something that's available to the commissioners? Yeah, so on uh, November 15th, uh, earlier this year, the United States Commission on Civil Rights put out a report titled Police Use of Force and Examination of Modern Policing Practices. Uh, Elon's gonna send out the link with a number of other things. I just think it's good, especially for those of us that like to do extra reading in our spare time. Um, there's a lot of things that some of the discussion and topics that we've talked about, there are already recommendations in this report that may influence some of our suggestions in the future. Uh, a lot of things that are very relevant and go beyond the 21st policing report as well. So just relevant if you want to check it out. If you want to Google it, if you're watching this live later and don't get the link or whatever, you can just Google um, US CCR Police Use of Force Report. Thank you. That's pretty good. Thank you. Anything else from any of the commissioners today? Or anyone else with any announcements? Then meetings on the calendar? As soon as I meet with these folks. <laughs> <laughs> or at least, if we at least talk, and it hasn't happened. We'll, try, we'll get, get it done before Christmas, okay? So uh, again, thank you for all of your hard work in uh, 2018, and just the happiest of holidays, good time with family and friends, loved ones. Thank you.